today on building back MSME business from crisis. It's being organized with UNIDO, PPDC Agra, and India SME Forum with the support of the Office of Development Commissioner, Ministry of MSME. Uh, just for the benefit of everyone, I would like to uh, mention here what is the significance of International MSME Day. The UN General Assembly in the 74th plenary held on 6th April 2017 declared 27th June as micro, small and medium sized enterprise day. Primarily to recognize the importance of MSMEs in achieving sustainable development goals. To promote innovation, creativity and sustainable work for all. This day is celebrated to mark the contribution of MSMEs in the growth and development of the country and in creating employment opportunities. I just wanted to convey the importance and significance of this crucial and very important day. And each one of us as contributors to this day. So once again, a very warm welcome to the Building Back Business from Crisis for MSMEs webinar this morning with UNIDO and PPDC Agra with India SME Forum. I am Sushma Murthania, Director General of India SME Forum, welcoming all of you once again. I would like to invite uh, Ms. Dr. Rene Van Berkel, India representative of UNIDO, to uh, please say a few words while welcoming all our viewers today. Uh, thank, thank you very much and uh, good morning and happy MSME day to all. Uh, I would like uh, to maybe make a few comments before we start, because as we gather today to dis discuss the achievements and challenges of micro, small and medium enterprise MSMEs, let us take a brief moment to reflect on the situation around us. Even though we did not do an exit poll at last year's event, I'm absolutely convinced that none of the participants at that time would have thought of the world we have now forced to get used to. The scale and spread of COVID-19 pandemic has shocked us all beyond uh, expectation and imagination. Just in the last 24 hours, India became the fourth country with over 5 lakh cases. And globally, the infection count is about to cross one crow in a day or two. India has already lost over 15,000 lives to the disease, and globally, the death toll is approaching 5 lakh people. And these are just part of the human suffering and sacrifice caused so far. I would call upon everyone to pay our respect and solemn sympathies with those uh, most affected in the pandemic and its health and humanitarian impact. I would kindly request everybody to observe a minute of silence in respect of those who have lost uh, their beloved ones. Thank you very much. Thank you on behalf of everyone suffering from this crisis. Uh, today's MSME Day, Sushma already referred to it, it's, it's celebrated just for the fourth time. And I'm proud to be to say that it's the fourth time I spent it also in India. The day was established by the UN General Assembly at the initiative of the government of Argentina. Uh, the UN, UN resident coordinator, Renata de Salien, would have liked to be there, but in the end was unable to do that. 
in, in lieu of that, I would like to uh, proceed with reading out the statement of the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, on the occasion of MSMD, MSME Day 2020. So I'll quite, quite be, uh, I quote from his uh, statement, which was issued yesterday. Message of the Secretary General, uh, Micro, Small and Medium Enterprise Day, 27 June 2020. Micro, Small and Medium Sized Enterprises represent around 70% of global employment and provide essential opportunities, often for the most vulnerable, including women and youths. They also make up nearly half of GDP in developing countries, playing a critical role in advancing shared prosperity. This year, Micro, Small and Medium Enterprise Day is being observed during a time of un unprecedented and compounded difficulties. The COVID-19 pandemic has unleashed a global socioeconomic crisis, spending, upending the livelihoods and well-being of millions of workers, disproportionately hurting low-wage jobs and widening inequalities. In face of these challenges, we, the United Nations, launched the United Nations Framework for Immediate Socioeconomic Response to COVID-19, highlighting the need to protect jobs, small businesses and vulnerable workers in the informal economy. We've also established the Response and Recovery Fund to support member state efforts. Governments must not only support MSME's efforts to weather the current storm, but also provide sustained support in building resilience to other external shocks. The health and livelihoods of many communities depend on it. On this day, I urged everyone to create an enabling environment for these enterprises to build back and thrive. Let us harness the power of micro, small and medium enterprises, recover better and achieve the sustainable development goals for all." Unquote. Unquote, I stated the words of the UN Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres. Thank you very much. Over to you, Shushma. Thank you, uh, René. Um, moving on, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Pani Selvam Ramaswamy, Principal Director, PPDC Agra, to give a few welcome remarks. But before that, I would like to uh, give a, uh, a small introduction about Sri Pani Selvamji. Most of us have this perception that government officers uh, hardly work, but Mr. Pani Selvam, he is the most hardworking person, most hardworking government officer I have ever met. Today, it's due to his efforts we are joined by almost 120 association presidents for this program, right from Mahabalipuram to Jammu and Siliguri to Gujarat. So it's all thanks to his efforts. Uh, he is one of the most progressive uh, officers and he is always so proactive to help uh, most of the MSMEs um, and meet any kind of challenges. During this three month lockdown period, he has conducted more than 100 online courses covering so many skill development programs, um, right from managing business to scaling up business to growing business and also disaster management programs. So I take the pleasure of inviting Sri Pani Salvamji. <laughs> Most respected Additional Secretary and Development Commissioner, Ministry of MSME, Dr. Rani, Unido Representatives in India and his team, the President of India SME Forum, the co-host of the event and his team, and UN India Business Forum, the leaders and representatives of MSME associations across country covering from Tamil Nadu to Kashmir, Maharashtra to Northeast. The speakers of the today events, I extend very good morning to everyone and thank you very much for taking time out, out of your schedule and joining as for the event. As Susma rightly said, the 27th June is being absorbed as the National MSME Day since 2017 and we are part of uh, these events always. On these occasions, the online event is being organized, which will highlight the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on MSMEs 
and the ways and means to overcome the challenges. In view of this, there is a considerable focus this year on supporting MSMEs to recover and restart the business. Today's event is reviving business operations of Indian MSMEs from COVID-19 impact and launch of Inido program, building back business from crisis, popularly known as B3C by Unido. So it is my great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our chief guest, the most respected Sri Devendra Kumar Singh, IAS, Additional Secretary and Development Commissioner, Ministry of MSME. We are fortunate to have ASMDC, who gets the field establishment, which works for the development and promotion of MSME sector in the country. His guidance and his directions will definitely offer a great help to overcome the post COVID-19 challenges. On behalf of the organizers, on my behalf, sir, I welcome you, sir. I welcome Dr. Rani and his team and the leaders of the MSME associations and the speakers, official and other representatives. And also I extend my welcome to all people who are not present in the webinar, but participating in the event via video, webcast from our website and also social media. So thank you all and have a great MSRB day. Thank you very much. Over to Sushma. Thank you so much, Pani Sadamji. May I now take the pleasure of inviting our honorary president, Mr. Vinod Kumar from India SME Forum. Mr. Vinod Kumar is a venture fund partner. He invests in small and medium businesses from ticket size 2 million to 20 million. He so far mentors uh, more than 11,000 MSMEs and more than 3,000 women entrepreneurs from India SME Forum. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Sister Jay. It is such a pleasure to be here. Last year's uh, MSME Day, we had uh, in Delhi, and it was a joyous occasion with more than, I think, uh, Paneer sir, I think it was 1100 people last year who joined us at the hotel. Uh, but nevertheless, we decided that we will not be, we will not feel cowed down by this COVID, as it is called, and we will sort of take it head on, and we will continue to organize uh, me mechanisms or platforms where we are able to reach out to MSMEs and the most important messages that need to reach out to them at this point in time. The first, uh, at the outset, I'd like to welcome DK, sir. I mean, I, I remember I used to have a, my first boss was called Mr. Deepak Kamdar. And so I, this word DK is, is very dear to me. So thank you very much, sir, for coming to the ministry. I've had a feel of his um, prowess. Uh, I've had a meeting with him in the advisory committee uh, just a couple of days back. And yesterday, all of us know the ministry has come out with detailed guidelines on uh, the um, uh, new uh, Udyam registration model, which is brought out. So I can understand the fact that he is a very upright and very clear minded officer who wants to do good and in no way wants to take a back seat. So thank you very much for, for being here, sir. Uh, Dr. Rene, obviously he, he heads Unido in India and he has been a great support to MSMEs in India, whether it is in terms of energy savings, whether it is in terms of innovation, whether it's in terms of building the ecosystem. So thank you very much, Rene, for being a part of this and continuing to be a part of um, uh, our journey uh, as far as MSMEs in India go. Paneer Selvam, sir, thank you very much for being a part of uh, this event today. Uh, we are delighted to work alongside you. And as Sushmaji rightly pointed out, uh, uh, we have we we are here for every officer that wants to work and do good for MSMEs. We will cater to any and any uh, uh, I would say request or anything that uh, I, I would say wants to reach out to uh, MSMEs for the benefit of MSMEs. We are there to support and thank you very much for that. We'd also I'd like like to point out just two or three things. 
uh, that I have been constantly, Sushma Ji mentioned the various people that I mentor. In fact, I've had very less sleep in the last three months because I've been constantly on the phone. Uh, the most important thing that I feel at this point in time that we are all going through and that most of us actually uh, need to do and are doing. You know, I believe in the first thing, which is entrepreneurs are truly resistant in the sense, how, what are they resistant to? Any ups and downs. We've seen loads of ups and downs in our lives and we come back with a vengeance every time. That's what is an entrepreneur. Now, that's the difference between an entrepreneur and somebody else who is working for somebody or, uh, you know, any other person. We, we sort of embrace risk and we sort of build our business, build our enterprise on top of that risk. The resilience that we show, whether in terms of, uh, you know, addressing an opportunity uh, faced with all sorts of uh, issues, that resilience basically helps us build bigger, better, uh, more tenable, sustainable businesses. And at this point in time, the other word which I'll use is every SME primarily <laughs> needs to find means and ways of how do we create a sustainable business model that will not only address all the opportunities that are in front of India today, but will also pave the way for, you know, our honorable prime minister's vision of a five trillion economy, which is very much possible. Having been in the US earlier and having worked there, I understand that business model there. And I can tell all of you that I can foresee that each one of us can be a very, very big uh, part of or spoke in this wheel of making this economy uh, a five trillion economy. And things like COVID or Corona, come what may, you know, we braced floods, we braced monsoons, we braced all sorts of things. So this right now is absolutely nothing in terms of, um, you know, we, we, we condone the loss of life. We, we know we've lost a lot of loved ones, but the most important thing is that our resilience as Indians is amazing. And we are, we are much more resilient than any other community around the world. And faced with any sort of onslaught, we will come out of it with flying colors. You, all of you have already proved it many times, and I'm sure all of us together will prove it again. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Sushma. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you very much for those words. May I now request Dr. Reni Van Berkel, India representative from UNIDO, to give a theme address on today's webinar, please. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I would also like to acknowledge our partner, so Vinod um, uh, Sushma uh, from India SME Forum, uh, the ACC, MSME, DK, DK Singh, uh, the um, uh, Product and Process Development Center, uh, Mr. Panashirvan. And of course, I want to also mention that the UN India Business Forum, which is also uh, partnering with us or supporting this. Uh, so um, it's my uh, pleasure to to uh, give a little bit of the background on this uh, and the theme setting for this uh, event uh, today. So reviving Indian MSMEs from the COVID-19 impact of building back business from crisis, B3C. So, and now my screen is locked. Okay, then I... I probably need to stop sharing and then uh, start sharing again. And the key is Alt N. So if you have to go forward, right from that. Yes, there we go. So uh, UNIDO in brief is we are a specialized UN agency that developed uh, support developing countries like India, where we've been working basically for 50 years on uh, technical support, in particular of, in support of MSMEs. Our current mandate is the Sustainable Development Goals, which is clearly centered around uh, SDG 9, build resilience infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster then innovation. And uh, this inclusive and sustainable industrial development is basically ad addressing the objectives that industrialization works to enhance markets, uh, to be economically competitive, uh, to uh, 
create, create shared prosperity, so decent working conditions, a decent return to workers and the communities, and ultimately also taking care of the environment and climate. So in India, we have a quite extensive program, uh, which is basically for, uh, based around four pillars. Uh, Vino was already uh, referring to it a little bit, uh, productive and resilient MSMEs, uh, solutions for climate resources and environment, so more the environment pillar, then the pillar around livelihoods and responsible business, and then the last one on the uh, more the strategic policy for industrial transformation. We have 13 ongoing projects with eight government agencies, and five of those are explicitly focused on MSMEs. So let me come to the MSME uh, scenario, because also I did, I think we did some work on this uh, uh, relatively early on, already in the, the second week of April, to look at what is happening with the MSME segment. And of course, it would not uh, surprise anybody that uh, Amazon manufacturing had come to a standstill. And basically, there were challenges in five areas. And I think that scenario has not changed. So, first of all, there's basically unprecedented un uh, unpredictability in the markets and policy. So we don't know how COVID will evolve. We don't know what the policy measures will be. We don't know how how what business can do in that regard. That has also then resulted in the second part, which is basically plummeted demand overnight, uh, a stop of uh, uh, stop of the, the demand for products, and that has uh, impacted the cash flows. Then we saw also the uh, reverse migration, so manpower change or uh, change over. Then there was a lot of concern, and they, some of those have turned out to, to nightmares. Even that uh, some of the equipment was degrading and uh, and the stocks uh, decaying. And then when we restarted, uh, some accidents have unfortunately happened. And uh, I think there's still a risk around that that we need to make sure that if we restart, we do it in a safe manner. And then the fifth one is the disruption of supply chains. Uh, so that already preceded the lockdown because uh, some companies were dependent on critical components, for example, from, from, from China that were not available in the automotive sector, even in, in the middle of January or uh, early February already. Uh, so I think that all of this comes down to the cash crow, uh, flow crash, um, crunch. But it basically means, means that MSMEs need liquidity to start their operations, but ultimately to get the economic engine going again, we need to have markets and demand. So markets and demands are the only part that, that will bring the MSMEs back into uh, uh, business. But to a certain extent, also uh, the, the crisis has been exacerbated by uh, some of the structural weaknesses, which were already with the MSME segment. So there is also an opportunity to real, rebuild operations, manpower, supply chain, and related issues. So that's the background of this uh, building back business to, uh, from crisis. So it's a knowledge and collaboration platform that provides a framework for action for MSMEs uh, that sees a, a, a crisis, as we know, was also referring to a crisis, but let's go and get out of this with our uh, colors flying, and then uh, to contribute to inclusive and sustainable industrial development. So it's structured as a set of tutorials, which has then uh, um, uh, supported by knowledge base and delivery webinars, and there's also opportunity to support MSMEs. Um, it was launched on the 30th of April by uh, Suresh Prabhu, and I want to highlight that we have uh, three uh, development partners, India SME Forum, the UN India Business Forum, and Empotec India Foundation. So how does this look like? So there's a, a roadmap that we think could be followed, and that would, uh, would uh, give a, a guidance to businesses, basically five steps. First, to uh, uh, relook at what is the revised business scenario and, uh, uh, and what, what can business do. So it makes no sense to start everything. We need to start with the things that still make most sense and are most actionable. And the second point is, is making the workplaces safe. So to prevent the spread of the disease, but also look at what we do is decayed equipment, decayed um, uh, uh, input materials, so that the factory can be working in a tidied way and in a safe way. And the third part is to restart and de-bottleneck then, because we cannot expect that all the pieces of the jigsaw all fit together in one go. So there will be a need for some uh, uh, adjustment, de-bottlenecking in terms of operations, workforce, supply chain, and sales. Then we look at more forward looking to bring back growth to business. And that is very much focused on uh, re-emphasizing business excellence and then doing business excellence, applying that into new areas, doing better and doing differently. And fifth is the more forward looking part where we say we should think ahead because we got into this crisis 
perhaps because we did not read the signals, because we were uncertain on those issues. So how can we set up business for more continuity uh, and maybe also a strive for business continuity standards under ISO? Uh, so th then I said this uh, works in terms of tutorials. So that looks a little bit like this. So that's a, a, a lecture and then some um, uh, images behind it. I'm very pleased to say that now Hindi and uh, Bengali are also available. Um, uh, and then uh, we have uh, uh, basically guidance notes, which is a bit like a manual or primer on each of these top topics, like six pages or so for each topic. And then we have some kind of a checklist with the uh, do's and do nots for each of those. And also these are available. I think this is Hindi and then here Bengali. So that is uh, available on these each of these five steps. And then we said also that uh, uh, I think Kennedy already said it that crisis is crisis danger and opportunity. So uh, how can we see that we turn this into an opportunity for growth and strengthening of the sector? And for that, we basically put this roadmap into uh, areas of business excellence, where where from past experiences there's opportunities for growth for strengthening on MSME segments. So we put them there in terms of more enterprising uh, enterprising of uh, businesses, looking at better uh, organizing of finances, better customer relations, uh, tidying up supply chain, uh, operations in terms of energy efficiency, productivity, innovation, manpower. So how do we work with the skills and, and um, supply of manpower? And let us also take the, the issues of uh, COVID protection for the workforce as, a, as an incentive to look at health and safety in a broader sense, because unfortunately, ultimately, it should be nobody getting hurt at the workplace. So those are the, then the kind of thematic areas that we have highlighted in this uh, uh, BC3. I wanted to also share a, a little bit beyond the immediate uh, response and we really think a lot of talk has been there about moving towards a new normal and, and uh, honestly, we have a different normal than we had a year ago. So I think in the future, and that's also the message of the Secretary General, health and well-being will, will likely to be more profoundly that. So we will see investments in health, and that's also, I think, the second deep dive session this after, this uh, this morning will be on health and uh, and and pharma equipment related opportunities. I think this is also highlighting the need for a greater hygiene. So we expect also a push for the kind of wash or swash barat sect sectors of uh, Indian society. I already mentioned that uh, uh, now that we need to do look for COVID in the workplace, we will, other areas of occupational health and safety should benefit. And there is, I think, uh, maybe less tangible at some, but in some sectors, there's certainly a push for more sustainability standards because we have seen also uh, irresponsible uh, uh, buyer behavior of orders cancellation and uh, rolling off the responsibility to small and medium sized enterprises. So that will also be a push there from the sort of health and well being perspective. But I think there's also other things and that might be not immediate in terms of today or tomorrow, but we will see gradual change to uh, in global production and consumption systems. And we think that uh, even though I don't have the glass ball to exactly tell how it would look like, I, I think we, we expect changes around three main uh, directions and that will be the future will be more circular, more digitized, and will aim for more resilience. So let me elaborate on each of those three. So uh, in terms of digitization, perhaps it's true that in the last three to four months, we've seen more rapid deployment of digital technologies than we saw in the past three or four years. So we've seen drones, robots, 3D printing be utilized in the response to the crisis in dealing as providing essential supplies, dealing with medical and related issues. And then that is likely to continue, and UNIDO has put uh, a lot of emphasis on the what we call uh, industrialization in the digital age, on the kind of advanced digital processing production technologies. And the, the key message from UNIDO's work is that this needs to be linked to industrial manufacturing and industrial skills, and then also to, to new skills of in, which are interdisciplinary. And then you need to put in some policy areas where there's a lot of emphasis. It's not just about technology, but it's about the human resource and the research capabilities to actually deploy digital and digital enabled technologies. Uh, then I think uh, uh, on global value chains, uh, there will be a, a, maybe a bit of a reboot 
to say that uh, uh, there, there will be global value change 2.0, maybe with a question mark. We see already immediate responses in terms of more stress tests, greater redundancy in supply chains. So people looking for two or three supply locations for critical parts. Uh, looking at shared responsibilities and this push for uh, uh, business continuity standards, uh, ISO 22301, which will slowly come after this. But in the longer term, we will probably also see a little bit of a, a, a reset in terms of uh, both in terms of physical location, so that with so many physical movements in the value chain, it becomes very vulnerable. So there might be a, a re-aggregation, reshoring, or not necessarily reshoring close to to uh, uh, con consumption hubs, but but closer together, less dependent on international transport. And then also in terms of innovation, because the, the, we, we've seen that countries where innovation, product design and manufacturing is closer, they've been the ones that came up most quickly with uh, alternative uh, ventilators, medical equipment, and so on. So there will be more emphasis to bring uh, product design, uh, innovation, and manufacturing again together. So then might see then a, a, a sort of a localization of value chains around integrated manufacturing hubs. So we might see more manufacturing and innovation integrated systems embedded into social and environmental performance of eco-industrial parks. So in closing, I just want to say that we, we have the present, past, present and future. So before COVID, during COVID, and I would like to emphasize there's no past or post COVID that will be with COVID. So it's not going to disappear. We have to work our way out. So building back business from crisis, the knowledge platform is one component of that for uh, during a recovery from it. And in the longer run, we will see then this transformation, more emphasis on health and allied sectors and transformative change in production and consumption systems along the dimensions of circularity, resilience and digitization. So thank you very much. I hand over back to uh, Sushma. Thank you. Thank you, Rene. Uh, moving on. Our Honorable uh, uh, Minister for MSME, um, uh, Sri Nitin Gadkari, was supposed to join, but uh, he has conveyed a message which he wanted us to read at the inaugural because he wasn't sure at what time he would be able to join uh, throughout the day. So, um, um, with the permission of our chief guest, uh, Sri uh, D.K. Singh, uh, Additional Secretary and Development Commissioner of MSME, I am reading out this message for um, all of our um, micro, small and medium enterprises uh, members and viewers who have joined us today and who are watching us. I'm being told that we are being watched by 1500 plus uh, viewers on this platform as well as the social media platforms of uh, UNIDO and India SME Forum. So our Honorable Minister Sri Nitin Gadkari has conveyed my best wishes to all the MSMEs on the International MSME Day. MSMEs are an integral part of the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan and the main aim of this movement is to help our MSMEs build our economy back from the crisis. The MSME sector has a huge potential for generating growth and employment. The government and Ministry of MSME is committed to provide the business environment and support required for our MSME sector. We can build new and reorient existing businesses to become competitive in global markets by improving quality through innovation, technological transformation, creating intellectual property, and adopting global best practices. Once again, my best wishes to India SME Forum and UNIDO, along with PPDC Agra, for this initiative today. And once again, best wishes on the International MSME Day. So that was um, a very inspiring and motivational uh, message from our beloved uh, uh, Honorable uh, Minister, Sri Nitin Gadkari. Before I uh, invite our chief guest, uh, respected sir, I would like to read out a, a roadmap plan which India SME Forum feels that uh, you know we have laid down for ourselves 
to build back these businesses from crisis. And we seek support from the Ministry of MSME and the Office of Development Commissioner MSME to help us build this back. So on this clarion call of our honorable uh, PM for Atmanirbhar Bharat, we propose uh, five pillars uh, or five actionable plan for achieving uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan. Number one, export orientation for every enterprise in the country, which will induce innovation, intellectual property rights, and quality automatically in their products and services. Second, a vibrant MSME ecosystem with platted factory complexes in all districts of all districts of the country equipped with export and entrepreneurship development centers in each complex. Third, strengthening of local supply chains and enabling creation of global value chains. Fourth, digital and technological transformation for all enterprises in India. And lastly, enabling ease of doing business for MSMEs along with low cost debt financing and export incentive in the range of 10 to 12%. So these are five actionable points along with rationalization of import duty and anti-dumping duty is bound to reduce India's over dependence on India's imports and position India as a serious exporter. So this is the roadmap India SME Forum has laid down for itself. And we believe that, I'm going to quote our chairman's quote here, the business of business is risk. And I feel all uh, entrepreneurs here recognize that. And with that same fighter spirit, we are all here standing together with each other uh, in this hour of need. Moving on with that, I would like to uh, take the opportunity of uh, inviting our chief guest today, Sri Devendra Kumar Singh, uh, Additional Secretary and Development Commissioner for Ministry of MSME. Sri Devendra Kumar Singh has held a number of important assignments in the state, in, in the state of Kerala, in different areas. Prior to joining Ministry of MSME, uh, he has worked as additional chief secretary agriculture and agriculture production commissioner. He was also on central deputation where he has held important portfolios in the ministry of home affairs, ministry of donor, and, and he has been an additional DGFT directorate general of foreign trade, New Delhi. During his stint as DGFT, he has been assigned the work related to formulation of foreign trade policy to enhance transparency, enhance e-governance, greater trade facilitation, digitization of process from start to end of the process chain and working towards the concept of whole government of India in the foreign trade government governance so as to achieve larger objective of bringing national interest in focus. He worked as chairman APIDA, where he focused on preparation of agriculture export policy, measures to open exports from Northeast region and creation of export infrastructure. I'm sure uh, this experience is going to uh, uh, be uh, very, very helpful for uh, building back our MSMEs uh, back in action. So once again, I take this privilege and pleasure to invite our chief guest Honorable Additional Secretary and Development Commissioner, Sri Devendra Kumar Singh. Over to you, sir. Good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. And especially, I would like to name UNIDO representative, Dr. Bharpal, founding president of India SME Forum, Mr. Vinod Kumar, 
our principal director ppdc agra sri paneer selvam ji madam susma director general india sme forum other delegates and all participants i am really very delighted to participate in this important event and this is a special day for our ministry as well because we are able to connect through this platform to so many smes and just before this when the message of the honorable minister was read who has stretched the entire gamut of the manufacturing in his message and his wishes i just like to repeat those sentiments to all the members of the msmes and convey our best wishes for their risks and their new ventures i also wish to convey that government is with them we realize that this is a period of uncertainty and this period of uncertainty has many limitations they are creating limitations at every level but there are no limitations to our courage there is no limitation to our dreams and i wish all of my msmes to think big we must think big and we must try to graduate upwards from the present situation this situation has brought many problems there is no doubt about it but it has also provided lot of opportunities and these opportunities who was the first to capture our msmes were the first to capture these opportunities in no time some of them reinvented their businesses identified the opportunities and they produced what was the demand of the day so many things came all of sudden you know and you know nobody was knowing about pp kits 3 months back now india is self sufficient in pp kit and we are in you know we can supply to the world there are so many you know covid related products which has been registered on our government gem portal and those who have registered they are getting so many orders from the government platform so these new opportunities has also helped i was surprised to note that the way services has developed services where you can connect with the you know consumers directly now there are many small firms companies who are directly connecting delivering home goods you know it is not just amazon on flip card you know i was able to hear success stories of a, some fpos of maharashtra sehadri they were able to connect with 700 societies and supplying you know vegetables fruits, fruits and vegetables to at their doorstep so there are so many success stories in each part of india which we may not be aware and people are really trying to come out of this yes we realize there are issues i would like to address today on three things first is the survival mode the second how to revive and the third how to thrive so we are in the mode to survive now how to survive we just to ensure how our businesses should not be closed and if it is closed it must be started immediately without losing time for that actually government has come out with 
some schemes like you know collateral free guarantee free loan from the financial institutions up to 3 lakhs crore it has started taking off people are have started you know taking this facility our ministry has now come up with the subordinate debt scheme where those accounts who have already become npa will be eligible to get finances from the financial institutions and um, other sources the third is the digital adoption in a part of our survival everybody is thinking how to adopt digital mode today we are communicating through digital mode you know during last uh, uh, you know one month of my tenure in um, msme i must have uh, uh, connected with so many organizations through the digital mode through all my offices through the digital mode and the feedback i got from my offices that you know they they feel that they are more accessible to the office to the head of the office you know where one to one they are getting more quality time so digital also has helps in improving the quality time with the people with the audience with whom would like to interact so and but this has to be taken in our manufacturing process also how to adopt digital way in manufacturing in automation floor management supply, supply chain management you know how to make contactless uh, processing in uh, agri processing so as to maintain highest level of hygiene so those processes has to be adopted the second is revive how to revive what uh, actually um, um, uh, dr rene was also mentioning how to revive now for revival government has come with a new definition right now we have three category with enhanced limit in investment and enhanced limit in the turnover now a micro unit is classified up to 1 crore of investment in plant and machinery and 10 crore in turnover our 90% of our my smes have less than 5 workers so how most of them will fall under this category they have to think big they have to reinvent and they have to adopt a process and make a business plan to graduate themselves from a micro to small if we are able to do that in the next 5 years it will be our success model you know if some of them are able to graduate a substantial number is able to graduate from a micro category to a you know small category that will be the real growth in the business there that will be the real growth in the manufacturing sector and you know it will bring new products new services new way of doing things and it will help now as part of this uh, revival you know you you have uh, uh, you know mr vinod talked about the definition today we issued the budget notification this process is going to be entirely digital the registration udyam registration we are not asking a single document for this registration not a single document you know it is total paperless you need not upload any document for the registration form but we are trying to link up with the government uh, other platforms other systems with the you know um, uh, cbdt and uh, other systems so that you know the data will take care and we will have a robust system and it will help to identify which people are growing and in what sector so this is part of the revival then part of revival also you know we we have a chain of uh, uh, development institutes in our india we have so many tool rooms um, and uh, one of our distinguished uh, uh, you know member of uh, paneer silvam is here you know in a short time they were able to come up with so many good suggestions to for the handling of this covid crisis for making you know pumps pumps was one of a crucial item which we import in huge quantity you know in dispenser pumps for sanitizer uh, you know purposes 
and now we are in the process of manufacturing similarly we have made so many detailed project reports and it has been hosted on the website of the development institutes which can be assessed by any msmes for these covid related products in all uh, states we have control rooms to help and also to connect with the financial institutions so we hope that these set up with the help of the you know uh, our uh, other stakeholders like unido or uh, semi forum or lagu or, or other you know there are so many uh, organizations they will help in hand holding they will help in revival and we are looking for you know partnership they have to hand hold and help the industry to you know sustain and to grow so I, you know there has to be open dialogue open discussion and to find out ways how to help them and to revive them the third is you know thrive how the business can thrive say after one year you know maybe after one and a half year when the crisis is going to be over you know our rbi has said that there will be very quick recovery you know in the fourth quarter of this financial year and the subsequent financial year of the economy i believe so i believe so but because this period of crisis is likely to be over in by the end of this year and then we will have a sound system and lot of you know um, already hope is there we will try to you know how to survive and grow so for that government has come up with the fund of fund where would like to you know support uh, new smes who are emerging in emerging fields who those smes who are in uh, you know growth related uh, fields maybe you know uh, you know that you know it will depend whether it is automobile or whether it is you know manufacturing or defense or you know whatever and some M msmes who are able to find a link with the mother funds they will be able to get substantial fold uh, in terms of equity so that will help we are in the process of consultation and the detailed guidelines will be come out and uh, you know so this is the process going on then part of this revival is the atmanirbhar no i totally agree with the all the five points which has been suggested by the india msme forum and these are the very you know uh, this this has been identified i can uh, see that it has been identified uh, with a lot of uh, you know thought process and uh, i am sure that uh, you know uh, you know if it is really uh, if we work together you know on all these five and uh, you know things will change i would also like to inform that you know uh, i had also made five groups in my development institute and i have also suggested five things and uh, our teams have submitted their draft report to us i will share you know i will share those reports and would like to take the feedback of our stakeholders you know because everybody is trying to think loudly and that is the need of the hour that is the need of the hour that you know we must think loudly we must think uh, uh, you know in a new ways uh, and uh, we must be open we must be open and we must look for innovation we must look for innovation and i would like to add that certain uh, our schemes like z scheme you know and then lean manufacturing so these two schemes are one of the core schemes where we need to build up and scale up in its implementation in different parts of india and if we adopt the approach of clusters it is likely to have more impact now i have feeling that it may not be clustered may be scattered but if we adopt a cluster and if we implement the impact will be more meaningful and more uh, uh, you know uh, visible it will be more visible and it will turn it, our msmes in a real growth engine of our society so with these thoughts i would like to conclude and uh, convey my uh, uh, best wishes once again 
to all the MSME fraternity and uh, assure once again that we are with them, government is with them, and uh, we will try to, you know, help, uh, you know, as per the requirement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for those wonderful uh, uh, foresight and offering a solid way forward. We are extremely confident that under your leadership, we will see MSMEs flourish, flourish and graduate to large globally competitive enterprises. India SME Forum assures and offers you full support to our 19 chapters and 86,400 plus members. As regards the scheme you mentioned, sir, Z, Lean, Incubation, IPR, and Cluster Development, these are all high impact schemes and we will do everything to enable them. So once again, thank you very much for your uh, time and those uh, words, sir. I would like to urge all our viewers to post your questions on the Q&A part so that we can direct them to our uh, esteemed speakers and panelists during the day. I would like to just mention here, there are four panels we are going to be conducting today. One, manufacturing for innovative and self-reliant India. Second, on healthcare, pharma and essential supplies. Third, on food systems and fourth on mending finances and markets. I understand that all my entrepreneur friends feel that policy is one and when it comes to actually working on ground and ground support is different. India SME Forum is here to lend you and handhold you to get that support through. So, during uh, this entire day today, we are going to be discussing how, what, when, and what needs to be done to get that support and start getting our business on track. With that, I would like to thank all the esteemed guests, our chief guests and members at present for the inaugural session. And I would like to you know, thank all our viewers who joined, uh, joined us today for um, uh, you know, being there and listening to us through our inaugural, inaugural program. Thank you very much. And we will be moving on to our first deep dive session of the day. I would like to uh, request my uh, team member to get the uh, panelists for the first deep dive session online. Once again, requesting all our uh, viewers, my entrepreneurial friends, to keep posting your questions on the Q&A uh, part which you see. You will see a question mark uh, uh, kind of an icon or sign there where you can type your questions. So starting with our first deep dive session on manufacturing for innovative and self-reliant India, may I take the pleasure of inviting our panelists, Mr. Taj Alam, King's Leather Products, also representing UP Leather Industry Association. I'm may, I, may I request all other uh, uh, members to keep your mics on mute, please? I'm Taj Alam from King's International. Welcome, Madam, sir. Thank you so much. Welcome, sir. Uh, Sri Jay Kumar Ramdas. President, Coimbatore Industrial Infrastructure Association. I'm Jake Mark here. Uh, good morning to all of you. Good morning to you, sir. Uh, Shri Shailesh Patwari ji, former president of Gujarat Chamber of Commerce and Industry, chairman of Nexus Group of Industries and Naroda Enviro Projects Limited. Shri Patwari ji. 
Ma'am, he is facing some technical issues, so we'll join in two minutes. Okay, so uh, he will join in soon. And um, Shri Neelai Varma, co-founder and CEO, Primus Partners. Morning, Sushma. Good morning to you, Neelai ji. Um, our moderator for the session, may I welcome Dr. Rene Van Berken to please take over uh, the deep dive panel, please. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning to uh, colleague panelists. So uh, the uh, design of the program was very much to try to get us to some uh, deeper understanding of the issues in selected sectors. So the first one is manufacturing and innovation. Uh, so also startup businesses. So wh what is the kind of manufacturing strength that India can build upon? Uh, what will the future look like? And we've already, uh, I shared some thoughts, but also the, the development commissioner sort some, uh, shared some thoughts. And how can we link to the global value value change, which was the strong call by ISF to, to look at uh, exports, so exports is global value change. Uh, so uh, we would like to make this as interactive as possible. So please use the question and answer point um, uh, screen so that we can see the questions. But I first asked the uh, panelists for their kind of opening remarks. And I would really like to ask for uh, maybe about four minutes uh, introductory remarks on where you are, how you see manufacturing evolving over the, the next couple of months towards a new future. So we may start with uh, Mr. Taj Alam from uh, the King's Letter. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having invited me as uh, one of the speakers, uh, Mr. Rene in today's webinar being organized on the International uh, MSME Day. Uh, well, at the outset, I would say that the revival of Indian MSME sector from COVID-19 impact should be like the rise of Phoenix from its ashes. So to live through another cycle of years, and uh, I being into the leather industry, uh, each, each sector I know would have its own problems, its own challenges, so we being in the in the leather sector and that to 100% export oriented leather sector, uh, we have uh, certain uh, different kinds of uh, yeah, challenges for us, both domestically uh, facing here in India and also uh, at the international level. So uh, whenever you want me to elaborate on that, uh, I would like to elaborate on that. But if you want to go along for the basic introduction of everybody, and then allow me to speak, then I would do that accordingly. No, just make your uh, initial remarks, that's fine. So maybe you elaborate for three, four minutes, that's fine. Go ahead. Okay, okay. well, uh, I'm I'm very thankful for the Government of India's uh, scheme of Art Nirbhar Bharat, or you can say self-reliant India, that's a very good one. But uh, while being vocal for local, government should also consider its present import and export policy, uh, which has been in existence from pre-COVID era. Uh, this I am referring especially here as the various industries immediately after the lockdown was over had started importing their raw material components uh, from different countries across the world, including China as well. And some of the shipments have also arrived at the various ports in, uh, in, uh, in Bombay and in Chennai and different places. Uh, but unfortunately, they are not being custom cleared, perhaps uh, due to the re recent face off uh, with China uh, on, on the border issue. So now the MSME sector is suffering tremendously in the leather sector due to the sudden step taken by the government. Uh, and reciprocally, Chinese government has taken the step for, uh, for restricting Indian imports uh, to China and Hong Kong. So my humble submission, uh, because uh, because the chief guest is already here in this uh, uh, of MSME sector is already here in this uh, program. My humble submission is that if government doesn't want to import anything from any particular country, including China, or export the goods to China, then a notification could be issued for future imports and exports. But my humble request is that the present import consignments lying already at the Indian ports should not be impacted as this could be a very big setback for the MSME sector, which have already paid in advance because China has a policy of paying in advance and then shipping the goods. So if we have already paid in advance, the goods are lying at the port. We are also uh, calling for or looking for kind of damage or storage charges at the port. If these goods keep lying there, 
first of all we started with a slow beginning in the international market because uh, europe and america and australia and other parts of the world are gradually opening up phase wise and the orders are not immediately forthcoming as they had been in the in the past in the in the pre uh, covid uh, period so i would uh, i would say that these imports should be immediately cleared and they should be allowed to be uh, to be used up by the msme sector so that we can export the goods whatever little orders export orders we have started getting from abroad because there are certain components like for example leather industry if we are using 90% of our leather indian made leather and we need certain zippers or buttons or metal fittings from china or from any other country then that would impact uh, our our exports so the msme sector which has like just barely started to move on it would be greatly impacted if these uh, uh, if these uh, uh, raw materials are held up at the customs there so this is what i have been i have been uh, requesting and uh, this is the right forum where where we we uh, we highlight all these different problems uh, i'm sure many msme like uh, like uh, like the uh, development commissioner was mentioning msmes have taken up the pandemic as an opportunity as you also said in certain crises it becomes an opportunity for others so uh, so india has was dependent on other countries for ppe kits sanitization fumigation equipments and related chemicals testing kits etc at the beginning of the lockdown today the country has more than 11000 registered suppliers of covid related products including icus ventilators hospital beds etc however msme of other product sectors are facing challenges challenging times and uh, there is a disruption of trade so this is the defining moment actually when we need comprehensive support from the government whether it is related to stimulus package policy reforms capacity utilization creation of conducive environment for foreign direct investments to build the economy back from the crisis while being competitive in the global markets so one more point i would like to say before before you uh, uh, before you stop me that shri nitin gadkari ji honorable minister for msme government of india has rightly pointed out in one of his press conferences for the need of bringing in the reforms in the uh, norms of ministry of environment and forest which is very relevant to the leather industry of kanpur and unnao region which is ma mainly in the msme sector and being badly impacted by the environmental challenges due to the frequent closures of the tanneries during the kumbh mela period and other issues related to the upgradation of common effluent treatment plants so sir this is what i have to say and now if you want to um, want me to add on further i have lots of things to say but if the time permits then i would definitely like to highlight those factors as well thank you thank you very much for this initial contribution so if uh, uh, the, the story is clear the msme is restart but will be critical and dependent on on essential imports and if you can't clear them then the msmes cannot start so the focus for locals should not exclude that we can import uh, uh, essential supplies and of course also the environmental issues and the clearances are very much of a concern and that's also some of the work that unida has been doing with your associations and so on so i'd like to uh, move on first and then maybe we come back so let's uh, also move to the other panelists so i would like to move to the south to mr ramdas from coimbatore uh, maybe your uh, uh, initial interventions please okay uh, good morning to all of you mr rene and friends a uh, happy msmd day to all of you um, i'm uh, we have of coimbatore um, tamil nadu in general and from uh, coimbatore in particular i would like to say that we are limping back uh, to the um, uh, towards a normal it's uh, though it's far away because every day the cases are going up and so it's uh, very difficult for us to uh, you know sustain uh, we have reached around 40% of the manufacturing capacity the entire uh, state i could say 40 to 50% depending on the location the problem with uh, this pandemic is uh, that we have given uh, the central government has given uh, the state governments the mandate to decide on uh, how to operate uh, whether to operate uh, conditionally whether the containment zones have to be all all aspects of this pandemic are, are to be decided by the state government so what happens is when india is one country and the supply chain is split across the country 
Uh, materials reaching down south because all of you know that uh, south, uh, especially with Chennai or Tour, is not so strategically located. We do not have any natural resources. Everything has to come from the northern part of India. So the the transport, the logistics, you know, the stability of the supply chain is a major issue. So though uh, business is improving, I could say that uh, all of us are happy uh, uh, that business is improving. But then supply chain remains a major issue even today. The second is uh, the cash flow. You know, um, every MSME now has a problem with how to uh, get cash because uh, that is part of the system. And this cash flow has to be overcome uh, by the government support, the bank support. And most of the MSMEs have complained that uh, the, the funds that were allocated, the Govind said the funds that were allocated has not reached them. Because most of them are saying that though it has been uh, put on paper, uh, put in black and white, most of the MSMEs say, the banks just say that you're not eligible for that COVID loan. So uh, most of the MSMEs find it very difficult for them to source funding, and that's become a major issue now. The third major issue is, uh, you know, uh, we all of our state has a, a home ground syndrome, what they call it. Uh, within the home state, the worker does not work efficiently. But the same worker goes to another state, it works very efficiently. For example, Bihar or uh, Bengal or Assam, workers inside their state do not work as efficiently as they work inside Tamil Nadu or Kerala or uh, Andhra Pradesh. This is, uh, this is a syndrome across the country. So what happens is most of the migrant workers who have gone back to their home state during the pandemic are just uh, either not able to come in because they all wanted to come back to their workplace. But then there is no standard policy uh, from the central government to the state government. So each state government has their own uh, kind of way of dealing with migrant workers. So unless we have a national um, a guideline on how to bring back the migrant workers to their own respective workplaces, because especially in Tamil Nadu, where we have a huge labor shortage, um, bringing back migrant em employees back to their work spot is very, very important. There is general insecurity among the migrant workers that uh, that they don't have enough work, but when they come here also, they, whether they will have work or not. So, but then our state has assured that everyone will get a work over and comes back here. The interest uh, part of the MSMEs also have to be looked into. And apart from that, one of the major uh, areas, it's not uh, because of pandemic, but it's always been there, is that access to technology has always been a major uh, challenge to the MSMEs. Because uh, whatever technology is available, generally goes to the larger companies who have the resources, who have the R&D facilities, and who have the connections, right, connections. So the, RM, the most of the technologies are going to those companies, whereas MSMEs are not able to get, they only have to go in for a reverse engineering or uh, they have their own uh, association where they have, can share. But Jen, we have to have technology centers across the country so that every small company uh, who wants to access technology can uh, go into it. Only then uh, we can strengthen participation in the global supply chain. Unless we are uh, up front, uh, up there in technology, it's very difficult for us uh, to do that. In at Co India, you must have heard of, we have common facilities where uh, we do skill development. Such skill development centers have to come across the country. Innovation centers have to come across the country so that then MSME will hugely benefit out of it. So as far as um, Tamil Nadu is concerned, we have a major issue as far as the line is concerned, the high tension line is concerned. Though the companies were closed for two to three months, we were not able to get the exemption from uh, the power authorities, the distribution companies, because they say they will be charging 100% of the power for even for HD lines, the maximum demand. Whereas some of the state governments have uh, given uh, some concession. So we are also requesting our government to give us 20% uh, of the MD charges only during the close, close down period. So these are the few issues that we have. I'll come back to you. If there are any questions, I can interact later. Thank you for the opportunity. You're not audible. You're not audible. Ah, OK, sorry. Uh, we, we need to fight with a bit of technology. But I'm very pleased to hear that you're saying uh, business is limping back. Uh, of course, we would like to see running back, but that uh, will still take some time, as you've also all outlined. But 40, 50 percent is already uh, a, an achievement and was maybe something which two, three weeks ago you would not have uh, expected or a month ago in that sense. But the cash flows and the efficiency syndrome. So uh, there is a need to, to look at also maybe more localized workforces, which we've also uh, experienced in other 
places, not only in Tamil Nadu, but also Gujarat, other places where we interact. So thank you very much. And the issues of technology uh, to, to uh, also address then the issues of that we, we ultimately we will have to do the same work with less people if we need to keep the distance. So many uh, issues you highlighted. I would like to uh, move on, uh, but uh, I think Mr. Patwari is still a bit struggling on the uh, on the IT side. So I would like to go then first to uh, Mr. Verma. Uh, co-founder and CEO of Primus Partners. So, Mr. Verma, please go ahead. Thank you, Rene. Thank you, Rene. Um, I think Mr. Ramdas and Mr. Alam can eloquently about the issues in the short term. So, I'm going to make some broader point about. to a crisis. And build for it to get covered into a small paragraph of a notification. And, and I think that's really important. And governments have to work much more closely with industries if you have to address even short term issues. But the broader point, uh, Dr. Rene, that I wanted to make is that we need a much longer term, longer term thinking on MSME. If we want to use this as an opportunity, it cannot be a six months or a one year plan. It will have to be a five year or a 10 year plan. Otherwise, we'll still be there. The last few years, contribution of MSME to GDP has almost remained stagnant. And yet we keep talking about MSME. So I think here is an opportunity for us to move forward. Um, it's three, three broader themes uh, for people to consider. I think it's important as MSME and somebody who advises MSME to realize we eventually produce for consumers and consumers want best quality at lowest price. That's who we are. That's what we do. And therefore, no consumer is going to do you a favor trying to buy anything but the best quality and low, and low cost. That's one point. Second, India has always been very, very strong. Neelaji, I think uh, uh, there's a network issue. Sorry, yeah. can you hear me, Sushma ji? Yes. Now. We, I think we lost him again. Yeah, Neelaji, you could speak. I've switched off my my uh, my. And as I speak, so that it becomes better. Is that better now? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes it's better. Yes. Yeah. So I was saying that we to go back and focus on our engineering, technical, and design capabilities because that's really where the changes need to be brought, and that's going to bring us sustainability. In that context, I think we need to do much more in 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 associate. I think we as a country have an amazing thing going on in our startup ecosystem. I think our startup ecosystem needs to be working much more closely with our MSME because that's where IP and manufacturing scale and innovation is going to come through. Uh, two other points that I would uh, make um, uh, is one, I think we really need to move away as MSME now that we have that we can be larger and dream big of saying, how will government help us? I think I think that is a losing battle. I think what we need to look at from government is not subsidy, but infrastructure, not low cost, but assured, uh, you know, capital systems wherein as a nation, 30 days, no, 30 days uh, uh, working capital is a norm and not an exception. And third, we have to focus on intellectual property in our manufacturing systems and manufacturing services if we have to take this opportunity. Otherwise, same discussion will happen year and year after year.
Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I think you uh, highlight uh, a, quite a number of issues that, uh, of course, uh, they have, what I was also referring to, that we, we need to look at this as an opportunity also for growth in the longer term. And you highlight the kind of uh, uh, quality productivity issues. And uh, we, I've also gone on record that if you talk about quality, people would say, oh, if it's lower quality, there's always somebody going to buy it for lower quality, but it's always going to be at the loss to your business. So there is this psych of uh, really working towards quality which is uh, very much there and then linking that also to uh, design and product design so improving what we are, we are actually delivering to the world um i think that we're still having a bit of a problem with mr patwari so i i want to to maybe pick up on the uh, the, the theme which was uh, also very much said by the by the by the government right now so manufacturing from india for the world so so what what if i may go around uh, from the, the different perspectives one more time what what do we see as where where India should then focus, because we can say we can manufacture everything, but we are unlikely to succeed everywhere. So where's where's the competitive strengths? Which are the, the three or four winners that India should, in your view, focus on uh, to uh, make a bolder impact on the export of manufacturing uh, uh, pro products or manufactured goods? So maybe I can go in, in reverse order then. Mr. Verma, do you have some views on, on where's the global value chain opportunity for India? India. Mr. Verma, are you there? Nilaji. Seems we have lost him. That, then, uh, okay. That, <laughs> <laughs> We're having a bit of a challenge. That's kind of uh, typical for MSMEs, isn't it? Always uh, something uh, popping up. So we, we work the, the way around. So maybe then come back to Mr. Ramda. So where where do you see from uh, uh, where you're sitting in the ecosystem uh, as the opportunities for uh, global value change for, for, for India? Um, see, there was one guy who had come to India to uh, look for uh, investment. And then uh, he was considering and I had a talk to him. Uh, basically, what he says is uh, India doesn't lack anything, you know, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of governmental clearances. Most of them, he says, is in place. But what we have to improve is our, uh, to not to be uncertain. You know, the uncertainty is one thing which uh, we have to work on. When we have to become a part of global supply chain, we have to avoid uncertainty in terms of price, in terms of delivery, in terms of quality in terms of adhering to the supply chain. So global supply chain is one large uh, area where when we commit something on time or uh, time frame or the price, we have to stick on to it. We have to work for back work in our efficiency to end, uh, ensure that we not only make profit, but also we supply on time and the quality that they require. This is a major, um, I feel is a, one of the major weak points that we have, which we have to address the uncertainty part of it. It's not only the, the, in, in your own uh, business, it's there uh, even in the external factors like transports or logistics. The uncertainty part has to be uh, addressed to only then they can do it. Second is um, India is a large democracy. So we have a lot of opportunities uh, when we compare to other countries like China, where uh, the, though they look very stable, but there are so many undercurrents going on. India is a large country where by and large uh, we have a political stability. We have uh, you know, uh, the, all, all, all part of uh, this thing, the states are together, they all work towards the same. So I feel that India has a great opportunity to become a supply chain, provided we cut costs on uh, lowering costs and improving efficiency. We have within the factories, pandemic, I've learned one lesson, you know, with less number of people, we were able to achieve more efficiency, more productivity. This, this uh, one positive um, aspect of, that has come out of pandemic is that uh, we were able to increase our manufacturing efficiency. So these kind of efficiencies have to be increased in order to compete in the global market. So in order to become a, a part of the global supply chain, number one, we have to cut down uh, um, uncertainty. Number two, we have to reduce cost and improve efficiency. 
Thank you, thank you very much for that. I, I think that's that's more an em emphasis on the system and the, the sort of business ecosystem that we need to work on and uh, uh, give it the degree of certainty that international buyers get buy order something they get it on time on the quality and not uh, not a different quality or later or so because that is that is also value to the customer. Um, so may I, may I go back to Mr. Alam? Uh, what do you see in terms? Of <laughs> Well, Mr. Rene, I would like to say that the few factors which have been mentioned by, uh, by my colleague speakers just now uh, were already there in place uh, uh, in the pre-COVID era. Like, for example, the competitiveness as far as the price competitiveness is concerned, as far as the quality is concerned, as far as the timely delivery is concerned, as, uh, all these factors were even existing at that time. Now, what has changed in the post-COVID area is that that we have learned to, to work in a different environment altogether. People didn't know sanitization. People didn't know uh, what is, uh, what is uh, like wearing these uh, PPEs and all these things. Now, these all conditions have changed in these three months' time. So people have started working, as Mr. Ramdas mentioned, that uh, we have started learning to work with lesser number of, of people. So that is the force because we were allowed to, uh, to, to make shifts of people and keep social distancing there and still working there. But as I said in the beginning of my speech, that uh, the orders are not so much forthcoming. So we actually at the moment, at this moment of time, we are not short of labors, at least in my industry, in leather industry, we are not short of labor. I'm not short of labor, trained labor, or, or skilled labor or semi-skilled labor, we are not having any kind of difficulty as far as the labors are concerned. It is actually, we are not able to give them the right amount of work, which they like, uh, as Mr. Ramdas has also mentioned uh, in his talk, that uh, we are like limping back to normalcy and we have about 40% achieved 40% of productivity. Now, if even if you take as an average that we have uh, achieved 40% or 50% of productivity across different product groups. Here, I would like to emphasize that in leather sector, India has the largest number of cattle health in the world. So much cattle is not found anywhere in the world except India. Next to the India is Brazil. So why we unfortunately, we are unable to capitalize fully due to certain short shortcomings. Now, what are the shortcomings? Shortcomings are Processing capacities of tanneries are not adequate enough. And tanneries are, let me tell you, the backbone for any leather industry. That means if you are making shoes, boots, belts, bags, sanitary goods, leather garments, or anything in the MSME sector, unless you have the leather, you do not have, you do not have the raw material. So, so today we are at the $4.5 billion of export, and India. Is, this is India's fifth largest uh, foreign exchange earning, let me tell you. And as compared to India, a small country like Vietnam, Vietnam's leather export is $14 billion. So just imagine $4.5 billion as against $14 billion in a small country like Vietnam. So what wonders are they doing? I mean, though they do not have the number of cattle heads we have, they are probably would be importing a lot of a uh, lot of leather uh, in their uh, for their leather production. But the thing is that we have to achieve the amount of leather we require for this thing. We need to develop more leather parts. We need to develop more capacities. We we need to have more leather. A lot of companies want to come to India. I have seen companies going to Bangladesh and, uh, and and some Chinese company, Taiwanese company going to Bangladesh, starting up the leather factories there. When they can do in a small country like Bangladesh, where India is a big country having a large resource of cattle heads, we can capitalize on that. We can use that. But unfortunately, we do not have adequate capacity, tanning capacity. We should make leather clusters, tanning clusters all across India, and we should produce more leather. Whether that leather goes as a finished leather to the other countries, like, uh, like for example, in the upholstery industry, in car industry, in aviation industry, or in kinds of value-added leather products. So these are the things which uh, and environmental challenges which we are facing in uh, that which, which hinders the supply chain is uh, is is the uh, pollution related norms which uh, as i mentioned that even mr uh, shri nathan gadkari ji msme uh, uh, minister has very rightly mentioned that some of the norms are age old 
and they need to be reformed they need to be revised in order to make us more competitive in order to make us more productive in order to make us uh, a, 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 a giant uh, supplier in the in the in the in the world leather trade so all these uh, challenges should be addressed uh, some of them by the government by formation of the uh, for these leather clusters upgradation of uh, common effluent treatment plants so that these closures which are happening so frequently uh, they are impacting our business and the business is consequently going to the neighboring countries like china pakistan bangladesh uh, and and vietnam and other countries so this is like what is hindering Oh, okay, thank you very much for your emphasizing the, the local development of the value chain coming into the leather sector. So thank you very much. I would like to uh, uh, move to Mr. Patwari because I understand he's online now. Mr. Patwari, are you there? Would you like to make some uh, uh, comments? We were discussing the manufacturing sector, what is what is holding back. So maybe uh, if you can make your observations uh, four minutes or so, uh, welcome to that. Uh, hello. hello, yes, we can see you. We have a good opportunity to do it again, and I think the Atma Nirbhar India, which is the vision of our Prime Minister, I think it is a nice way that these small and medium scale industries can make it. The only problem what the MSME is having is the scale of production. They are doing very small size of the production. So what I suggest that there has to be some cooperative society where the small industries can join and one big unit can be created. And there will be a utility <clears throat> which will be served from there, like a steam, power, gas. So they have not to go for it. And there will be a common affluent treatment plan to treat that. We have a huge scope. Unfortunately, we have a lot of problems with the policy related issues, mainly pollution control and environment clearances are very, very bad way handled by our bureaucrats. I must say that if the product is once given from EC in any part of the country, the same product shall not have to go for EC process. It has automatically to be given to that industry. Suppose somebody wants to manufacture. But very adjacent factory, if he does want to make same product, he has to go for an easy process, and that takes minimum one year, two year, three years, I don't know how much time, and it costs too much. So the environment clearance, once given for one product, should be made applicable to anywhere it can be manufactured in the industrial estate area, of course. And secondly, the common facility should be created so that the small people they have no such a knowledge of treatment, conveyance of the effluent. So deep sea discharge pipeline just now, which we are doing in Gujarat, the safe condition will go to the sea. Otherwise, we have a lot of NGOs. They are taking the matter to the court. And there are a lot of issues the MSME is facing today. Huge penalties, crores of rupees penalties are being imposed by national green tribunals. Now, there is also an issue when there is an accident in the factory. The police is coming in the picture and section 2304, the criminal act, is being imposed on the owner and police is filing FIR. So in accident case also this is happening. So I think there are a lot of areas where the policy decisions are to be made favorable to the industrialization Otherwise, the small industries cannot face all these requirements which the government is asking for. Thirdly, suppose some area, I had talked to our Honorable Minister, uh, Mansukh Mandavya, and I requested for Gujarat, you give a huge piece of land, which is not productive. So near Bhavnagar, suppose we got a land, some, all MSME together will make a we have to first make a market research, which is not with us. We have to create the data, what is we are importing, how much we are importing, and what is the future expansion. All these things, data is considered, and then on that basis, a common manufacturing plant, suppose to be as I said, KSA, KSA,
uh, sodium nitrite, all these products we are importing. 100% we were manufacturing, but now we are importing. Why? Because of the government policy. So, sub is a very big issue and is a very big issue. We have all industries making 5 tons, 10 tons, it won't make any sense. That will be not viable to compete international market. So, there has to be a big size of the manufacturing. Government should support MSME and there should be a cooperative movement like Amul Dairy is doing the milk product. That is how you can also do this. Thirdly, our main consumption of dye intermediate is textile. But textile is only doing hardly 8 to 10 percent of Chinese capacity. And China is buying cotton from us. Why government should allow us to export cotton? It has to be manufactured here so that farm to fashion, which is also the vision of our prime minister, that from farm it should go to final user, ready made garments and everything. When you get things should be made here, and that is possible. So this is what is it, because textile is the biggest user of the dye and chemical. But we are exporting cotton, we are not making clothes here, not making ready made garments here. So I think there are certain issues which we have to look at. The main problem what the industry is facing is the fundamental compliance. The norms are absolutely rigid. They have Suppose I have 250 COD, and if I make 252 COD, my sample is trading, I have to pay penalty. This is not possible. So I think government should come out with the broad outlook. They should give the basic infrastructure, and I think associations are ready to support the government and this cooperative way, because suppose we do anti dumping duty. Then what happens, the large industries are increasing their domestic rate. As for example, the nitrite, sodium nitrite, they brought into the picture, they are the only manufacturer. And now they have increased the rate from 25 to 42 rupees. So this is what is happening. So government is want to make MSME strong. MSME is the maximum employment, maximum all the export contribution. But MSMEs are not being it is a single window which we claim, but there are a number of doors. Window may be same, only single. So this is single, not single window. I think if the government has now concerned to fight anybody, you have to make unite, you have to see that MSME grows and MSME can not grow alone. There has to be political support, bureaucratic support. Then only MSME can definitely do a great, see all the developed countries, MSME is contributing 65 to 75 percent of the GDP. Unfortunately, India, MSME is contributing only 28 percent of the GDP. This is where we are lacking. We give maximum employment, but the support from the government and the officers are negative, and it has to be improved. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your contribution and uh, really also emphasizing the need for uh, uh, clustering cooperation initiatives to uh, uh, to to live up to the, the the dream of quality, productivity, environmental clearance. So more structure in the in the sector that could really help. And I'm 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 seeing a similar theme that Mr. Alam was talking to. Let, let's look at what we have internally. What, we, what India is rich of, we have a lot of cotton, we have a lot of uh, uh, cattle hide. So, what can we do around this? So, not always just look outside what can we get and what can be the manufacturer, but how can we set up the, the supply or, or pull it out of India, so to speak? So, I think that is a, a very valuable uh, contribution. I think I, I'm, I'm looking a little bit at, at the time. So, we are running a bit short of time to elaborate more. So, I would probably uh, like to, to, to thank uh, the panelists for this. Uh, contribution, Mr. Alam, Mr. Ramdas, Mr. Patwari, Mr. Verma. Thank you very much for your uh, contributions. I think there has been a, a discussion around some recurrent themes that for for growth we we, uh, we have the the one part is the is the the uh, getting from uh, limping back to running back, so uh, speeding up the recovery. And for that, there is uh, uh, certain issues which are different from sector to sector and from uh, region to region. And then I think there's also the recognition that in the longer run for to bounce back better we need to address also some of the 
structural issues around innovation, productivity, uh, security of contractors, save, uh, the sense that uh, once an order is placed, that it will also be delivered and so on, and, the, and potentially also the environment issues, which, uh, of course, as some of you would know, speaks very much to my uh, side, as we, we like to work also a lot on the clean tech innovations, which we did in uh, an energy and environment, which we do work in Coimbra Tour, in Kampur, and also done in, in Gujarat. So uh, thank you very much for this uh, panel on uh, manufacturing and uh, looking at self-reliance manufacturing for the world. So thank you very much. I hand over back to Sushma for the introduction to the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rene. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rene. In fact, I would like to thank all the panelists here. And especially, I would like to, um, I welcome the suggestion given by Mr. Patwari. Uh, you know, the, the, the suggestion uh, regarding setting up common manufacturing plant, I would uh, like to go ahead and add here that India SME Forum has already undertaken a study for the Ministry of MSME where we are, um, uh, you know, doing a study on what are the products which uh, could be exported and which could also serve as import substitutes. So uh, we have that study available and we could approach not just the Gujarat government, but with our local uh, industry association partners, uh, we have uh, Co India here, Codicia, and all together. We could approach various state governments first to set up common manufacturing plans, and second, sector wise policy reforms. Because until and unless that happens, uh, but things are not going to change for better. And uh, of course, uh, because MSMEs is a state subject working cohesively and in collaboration both central and state um, uh, has to happen so so thank you very much esteemed panelists for this and we will take it up uh, as a part of our roadmap that we've laid down this morning uh, for getting back msmes into business thanks once again and i'm going to invite the second panel uh, on the board now the second panel is on healthcare, pharma, and essential supplies. May I invite uh, Sri Arun Prakash, MD, Genetics Biotech. I once again request all other uh, panelists and uh, viewers to please keep your mics on mute. Kindly keep your mics on mute. Shri Arun Prakash, MD, Genetics Biotech. Shri Rahul Jain, Partner, Superswa Swaps. Dr. Smita Naram, Owner, Ayushakti Healthcare. Namaskar. And Mr. J.K. Rajgopal, from Dr. J.R.K. Research and Pharmaceuticals Private Limited. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to you. And the session would be moderated by Sri Vinod Kumar, Country President, India SME Forum. Over to you, uh, Vinod, sir. Uh, once again, I'm going to urge all the uh, viewers. I'm, I'm seeing some of the questions, but we will be taking questions uh, 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 in between and towards the end of this session. Over to you, Vinod, sir. Thank you, Sushmaji. It was a pleasure to uh, listen to uh, Nilay, to uh, uh, Mr. Patwari, Mr. Ramdas, and Mr. Alam. Uh, and uh, they are actually in concerns with what we've been saying all this while, that we need to have certain uh, 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 you know, things that need to happen overall and uh, I, I believe in one thing, which is that, you know, when we are talking about uh, specifically um, MSMEs, um, from quite some time, uh, India has not had any focus on MSMEs at all. Most governments primarily look after large scale, large sector companies, and they want those large sector companies to come in. Uh, can, can I ask all my co-panelists to please put on your videos, Dr. Naram, uh, Mr. Uh, Arun Prakash, uh, please uh, let's let's have your videos on can, so we can all see. Can you see. hear me, sir? Can you hear so me? My video yes, is on actually. 
but uh, my video is my also... video is on okay yes now it is on uh, dr yeah. narayan we can see you that's a lovely yeah, thing yeah. to see in the morning uh, yeah. thank you for being here uh, dr mr arun prakash can we also see you i can I'm... see mr rajgopal and i can see rahul oh, both here okay. speaker phone there, i have no to everybody camera dot on your screen this is none actually i am having you know a lot of issues since last one are connecting actually oh okay um but doesn't matter we will we will try and we we are able to hear you so we will uh, sort of um, try and make do with whatever little we have uh, you know we are all technologically challenged we are all learning these days uh, nevertheless um thank you for being here today for finding the time to be here with us thank uh, you to to set the mood um i'd like to talk about two things one is that most of us are aware of the situation that uh, msmes are having business owners are having or entrepreneurs are having to face with this covid situation and some of you have actually turned this entire thing round on its head in the form of you know finding opportunity where there was little and while you know we were all despairing as to what to do and what not to do and you know you know a lot of people have uh, in the q and a section put a lot of questions on you know there's a lot of issues there are a lot of problems how do i get out of it so we all look up to you as entrepreneurs that what have you done in your own uh, business and how have you basically um, looked at the opportunities that lie in front of you and how have you converted them into uh, you know business for you or growth areas for yourself or diversification areas uh, for yourself at this point in time to find light where there may be none so i'd, I'd like to first go to rahul rahul um, uh, you know makes swabs so he's been in the business of uh, cotton swabs and all that so let us let us hear from him now what is it that you did and what were you faced with you know like everybody else no workers you know lockdowns and then you have you have a situation where there's a demand for swabs and so how do you address that and what did what did you do Uh, good afternoon and uh, uh, good afternoon to all my panelists and uh, it's really very nice to be here to be able to speak to you all uh, the point is that uh, you know i feel that uh, nothing that which has been done overnight and over stuff when uh, we as companies and uh, i'm sure that arun ji or sudarsh they would also agree with me that uh, it's basically years of work that actually comes together at one particular specific time where you are able to make a good use of it so it's not exactly um, something which is happening overnight that we are able to change or maybe do something really spectacular so i mean uh, it's it's basically 10 or 20 or 30 years of work which has come together and uh, to get a, a kind of opening where we are able to uh, you know use our application to convert that hard work back into that specific so this is this is exactly i think we also were able to do because when we had a, we had an excellent infrastructure we have a world class infrastructure to produce a hygiene cotton products now being um, just a cotton company we uh, never ever uh, were able to do any any synthetic fiber uh, and uh, and processing in mean, any money anybody who is doing text uh, some technical uh, textiles or let's say any these kind of stuff they know that the lines are really very specific for cotton for natural fibers and for synthetic fibers so it's a, it's very different i mean so it's only the experience application and a tremendous infrastructure and above all i think uh, our fantastic team my uh, my senior partner rajiv let's say he uh, he has a tremendous experience in uh, in having put up all this together so we as a team were able to uh, find uh, that there is an opportunity coming in term in in a form of crisis and uh, we were able to just convert that around so i mean i would just put it that way so uh, this is how i would feel that everybody should uh, go up with a positive outlook not exactly you know sitting with you know kind of hands tied and not being able to do but if you try we'll probably do something but if we don't try we'll certainly not do anything that was a, that was a good start thank you you know for motivating all of us i'd like to go to uh, mr rajgopal you know mr rajgopal also is into um, research in uh, pharmaceuticals primarily 
So, Mr. Rajgopal, what is it that you figured out in terms of opportunity? How did you handle the effects, after effects of the lockdown and uh, so on and so forth? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Vicky. See, uh, from, we, are, we are based in Chennai, and uh, we've had this roller coaster in terms of several uh, rounds of lockdown. As we speak, we are still having some restrictions. But fortunately, the government, uh, this particular industry is a little blessed in that it is coming into the category of essential goods. So we had this uh, little leeway which we could have in terms of having our business operations on uh, with special permissions. But uh, the challenges were there very much. It's not that we were uh, free of challenges. We had difficulty in terms of uh, logistics, in terms of getting our products across the country. Uh, and then we also had a biggest challenge was in terms of having a business development uh, effort. You know, in pharma industry, there are two parts. There is a bulk drug industry, which most companies, are, large companies are involved, and there are formulations industries, which are typically the branded products. And we are in the business of uh, research-based herbal uh, medicine, we make manufacturers of research-based Siddha medicine, it's part of the Ayush. So this has actually uh, transformed in the last few months. We have had a great uh, opportunity uh, in the marketplace because uh, there is a, this, this entire COVID is, has been a health problem. And people have realized that uh, you know, in the long run, building their immunity is the only uh, sustainable way of, uh, you know, fighting not only this and anything else which is coming in the future. So we actually uh, conceived a, 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 an initiative called Build Immunity, Save Community. Uh, it's as simple as that, Build Immunity to Save Community. And we have created a basket of uh, product offerings which are very well researched and documented. And uh, in particular, with the support of the state government in Tamil Nadu, which actually is encouraging the alternative systems, uh, there is one drug which came up uh, very well recognized, which is called Kabas Sura Kudini, uh, which, as I speak today, there are four centers which have been established in the state for treatment of COVID uh, with this and uh, other uh, traditional medicine. So there is a big opportunity which is coming up in terms of, of uh, people's readiness to look at alternative systems of medicine. And we are being in this business for almost 28 years, and we have built a credibility in coming out with very well researched products. And we also uh, have the support of the medical practitioners who are also opening up from other systems of medicine. So for the Indian point of view, for Indian MSMC point of view, this is a massive opportunity for the Indian Ayush uh, pharma industry. And here, so the only caveat I will put is that there has been a little bit of herd mentality amongst a lot of MSME manufacturers to run behind certain kind of formulations. There is a lack of standardization and there is a lack of credibility in a few unfortunate uh, claims made by companies, unscrupulous claims made by companies with uh, no research background. So I will say that this industry has got a very big opportunity for people who are serious and sincere about their uh, uh, you know, long-term objective. The public interest and India's interest in particular in getting back to the wellness products and traditional medicines is, is opening up. We have huge interest across the country, across the globe. Uh, the only restrictions are that the uh, international trade is yet to be opened. And the Indian industry has to invest along with the Irish ministry in building standardization for products. You know, uh, when you take a herb, it's not so easy to standardize. It's like making tea and coffee in everybody's house. Your tea and my tea, your tea. So a lot of differences. But the, the natural expectation for the consumer is to have uh, uh, every bottle of uh, medicine should be the same, you know, whichever batch paper. So a lot of work is still to be pending. As a company, we have done a lot of standardization of herbal uh, medicine preparation. And uh, we have we have taken a lot of uh, leeway, in, I mean, leap in terms of scientific approach to the manufacture as well as in, this is very important. I think MSME industry should not be just aping, and that has happened in the allopathy pharma industry where they have typically aped some formula and done it. Please do your own homework. I think uh, in, even if you are in a small niche industry, you can make a, a big uh, thing. 
the other uh, uh, request i would put it across to the uh, government is uh, this is this particular system of medicine and also the uh, other systems they need a good gst relief you know uh, branded uh, standardized formulations are being having a gst of 12% i think in the last few months we have established that there is a huge way to build the immunity of these people and reduce the impact of the pandemic uh, in a very big way and uh, therefore some relief should be coming and uh, the other thing is uh, opportunistic pricing has been there by a lot of large manufacturers who are supplying certain uh, raw material if you go deep deep you will find one large entity controlling this whole thing yes. So far, yes if you look at plastics if you look at a container as simple as a container for a packaging deep down you will find one large uh, i don't want to name the company but one large entity is there there is a huge scope for import substitution by the indian industry i my colleagues in the other industry should work on packaging material which is a very basic uh, input for pharma industry and uh, from uh, the other point is logistics you know the cost of logistics is the most hard. amazing sardo by tanvinaram da 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 ra sorry smita i think i think you you we can hear you i mean somebody's yeah. phone is on sorry Sir, yeah. uh, the cost of reaching the goods in different parts of the country is so high that it becomes prohibitive for msmes to successfully compete with large enterprises large, large companies yes. so uh, there needs to be a far more cost effective way of uh, uh, logistics certainly if there is some support which can come from the government in terms of okay based on sales can you subsidize the logistics cost of reaching the goods because for example uh, our products are being sold all over the country right up to nagaland up to jammu and kashmir and jaisalmer and yonder but Uh, naturally uh, being an mrp driven organization you cannot equate uh, the logistics cost so it is going to be a differential uh, a difficulty for companies to go beyond uh, a certain minimum geography so that is something that we need to see and investment in r&d and uh, standardization will be another point and one theme for the indian pharma industry particularly ayush industry i will say is build immunity save community uh, in the long run this system of medicine is standardized and well executed the kind of billions of dollars which go into investment in in r&d in uh, in the allopathy drugs even a small fraction of it goes into this and trickles down to msmes we have a several trillion dollar industry that that gives me another idea maybe we can get all of you together on one platform and you know what you what you r- rightly said you know we can market all of this as a whole you know um, and help all of you together you know in in order to you also talked about logistics for example wherein uh, you know you have certain states like for example northeast states they are asking you to set up plants there wherein you know they will provide logistic subsidy you know for you to uh, send material outside to any other part of the country similarly in jnk similarly in himachal so there are a lot of states like that which are offering subsidies for you basing your plants uh, in those in those places so maybe yes uh, you are absolutely on dot and i i have taken a cue from you we'll discuss this further i'll i'll go on Thank to you. dr naram uh doctor sahab uh, you are clinics you you have a wide uh, i i i would say network of clinics all across the country and then you were faced one day with a situation where everything is shut and you nobody can come to your clinic and nothing is going to happen and uh, so then how did, have you moved forward from you know now practicing uh, i would say digital medicine or telemedicine as it's called now and has your business model completely changed or what have you done oh, you 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 you're on mute you're a mute doctor yeah so uh, this was uh, as soon as the lockdown came it, uh, we were shocked and we didn't know what to do so our core team combined together we decided that uh, based on my knowledge as a doctor i knew that this is going to stay like this until at least august september so uh, and we have half of our revenue comes from doing a panchakarma treatment which is hardcore massage and all the which completely was gone completely so uh, 
and you know we are present in other parts of the world as well germany america everywhere and everywhere the clinics were completely stopped closed actually uh, italy was worst impacted at, uh, out of uh, all the countries where germany was uh, slightly less impacted so uh, <clears throat> we decided as a team uh, first of all what we did was we we decided to focus this uh, months for survival so uh, there was a one team created which will focus on survival which means that we have to make sure that we create enough revenue uh, to take care of our human capital because the people who work with me are for me like a like an asset so in this time also i would like to make sure that they are paid their salaries even if they don't come for work so that was the first thing we did and then we cut down a lot of non productive expenses and we in fact it was eye opener because we realized that we were actually carrying so many non productive expenses <laughs> non -productive which i think items. we don't need at all <laughs> and that's how we actually survived and we found that we can do video consultations and the boundaries were completely broken we are doing now video consultations from jammu kashmir all over india actually right now Uh, first we were just looking at uh, local wherever the clinics are to do the one and one consultation doing the pulse reading so we invented now face reading technique which is doing <laughs> a video consultation <laughs> diagnosis <laughs> using face reading <laughs> so <laughs> so that was but, but, but is there something that is listed in ayurveda that apart from the nadi you can also take the face and tell what's wrong mukha vanchan it is a samudrik okay. uh, science which we didn't explore in the past samudra vignan we call it uh, it it's mentioned in our one of the vedas uh, the sam veda actually we never explored that so we started doing this samudra <laughs> and it it is successful it's getting really people are able to read the faces and darkness this was great so that's how you know we actually created uh, we we are surviving and also making a little profit actually and in in germany and uh, uh, america where our clinics are there we did lot of video consultation and the sales are maintained and and that's the benefit for me that you know we are able to supply a very strict standard quality to germany and those countries and not so many ayurvedic people are there so for this reason there our sales were not impacted because the faith is very high in the meantime of course we did uh, also the tap opportunity of selling immune products and we published a scientific research papers uh, and case study also on using it on on certain patients as well plus scientific research paper for immune boosting to prove that this is boosting the immune system and it and it was accepted luckily so we we promoted lot of immune boosting formulas across the world which actually generated quite a huge amount of sales this is the new opportunity we found and we have formed a team which in future will rather develop the product side of our uh, of our uh, company now we were only into service so this is like <laughs> new breakthrough in our so these two new opportunities came up in the meantime i created because people were free the top team were really free in many ways so uh, as i told you we created three team one was just focusing on survival the, from the top group uh, our managers all over the world and the other one was focusing only on how we will revive plan and thrive plan so we did revival plan we have done already but it looks like we'll start the revival from july already instead of august originally it was september august but because we done a great deal of survival with even making little profit we will start the revival plan from july which means we will slowly revive our old come back to because sales have gone down definitely but the because of the cost cutting the profits have been maintained and then we've created a deep uh, thrive plan which i think is going to create a major major growth for our company so if if we would have been working routinely i think we would not have done this kind of a deep planning because of lack of time so this i think is one thing that Uh, created a major opportunity for us that we created 25 years of plan and how we are going to touch a billion life on this planet which country we will go in which year and how many doctors how many patients how, and also we we actually created a, a product wing which was not there earlier in our plan 
so we will actually scale up the just the product selling like uh, prescription or otc products so that's what i think we personally have known through in this we have found this benefit and this is how we came through the whole situation i think and uh, that was excellent is happening for the good that's it that's what i believe and that was excellent you know it is it's a it's a it's a it's, a, it's like a strategy document for beating covid <laughs> you know, for business. You know, I've, I see lo a lot of people coming to us, me and telling me, when is the government going to give us some money for uh, salaries that I can pay? And you didn't go to any government. You decided that you want to decide on your own. What is it that yeah. you are going to do with your business, re uh, re uh, vitalize it, uh, relook yeah. various options, precisely what you have done. And yeah, yeah. one of the other very important things, we don't realize the sort of costs that we we are running exactly. business. You, you look at the cost that you are running. So amazing. You know, I'd like to go to Mr. Arun Prakash. Uh, 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 Arun Prakash ji is into biotech. So, uh, and he has uh, he has a wonder drug already, which is uh, you know uh, an amazing uh, drug. I've used it myself a couple of times. Arun ji, would you tell us how you managed to deal with this COVID opportunity instead of the crisis? Or did, did it turn into a crisis for you? <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, Vinoji, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. It's pity I'm not able to get onto the video. Um, you know, um, in this uh, pandemic crisis and with everything shut down, uh, probably healthcare industry was the only one which could keep their heads above water. Um, having said that. Uh, even in that space, I think um, everything was focused towards uh, COVID management, uh, COVID testing. So uh, we being in this uh, space, healthcare, and um, we, we were just actually shut down for a week. And then we realized that for how long can we keep doing, you know, uh, will this continue? And, uh, uh, you know, most of the products that are required for COVID management or testing were all being imported. And there we set the team rolling in saying, you know, what needs to be done. And I must say that what one could have achieved in uh, probably in a year or two years, we managed to do that in two months time. Yeah, we created products which are going into uh, COVID testing, uh, diagnostics and management uh, within two months time. We have done the import substitution. We have, uh, we developed those products, and we have developed of the quality which is world class. We are actually ready today that we could actually get into a regulated markets with those products. Uh, so we are going through a lot of validation. I think this was in this crisis was an opportunity for a lot of us to if we, we if we have taken the initiative, we we have managed to do it. And I I believe that all of us uh, have the ability. It's just that we don't take initiatives and, and then this crisis was uh, an opportunity and has driven us to take uh, the initiative. Um, excellent. I, you know, uh, you know that, was, that was really excellent, uh, Arunji. Yeah. What I want to uh, ask and starting from you, you know, a quick uh, primer for everybody that is listening in as to what exactly do you feel is the market or is the world going to come to and how do we quickly ramp up our production uh, to deal with what the world needs today. You know, the world is looking at various possibilities for supplies, whether they are medical equipment, whether they are telehealth services in the case of Dr. Dr. Naram, essential supplies, pharmaceuticals, you know, all sorts of things. So where is the opportunity and how do you feel we can ramp up to, to, to reach out to that? Yeah. So I think this, uh, this pandemic, this crisis is not going to get over in the next couple of weeks or days. Uh, this would probably continue for uh, for more than a year to uh, you know come, uh, and uh, this has opened a lot of opportunities for uh, I would say entrepreneurs all over the world. And there are many areas that one can uh, you know look at in the healthcare or in in this crisis uh, from management, protection, cure, uh, and uh, so uh, I think. Uh, the, for an MSME sector and in the medtech area, uh, the opportunities are there. The initiative has to be taken. One has to scale up quickly, uh, put their minds together. But I, I also feel that government has to do a lot. Your government has to do a lot of hand-holding. There have to be a lot of incubators or technology 
enhancement centers where we can have a vision, we create a product, but to meet the world standards, someone has to quickly help us to ramp that up. Ramp you know, that up. Uh, which, uh, which many of us may not have in-house capabilities. Yeah. So if someone there, uh, a technology center where we can go and say, oh, we have a catheter, you know, can we, you know, make this as, as a global, uh, meeting the global standards? So if they have the capabilities, they just quickly help us to ramp that up and we move forward quickly. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in that area. A uh, lot of opportunity the government has been talking of that the uh, industries from our neighboring countries would be relocating. How, if they're relocating, how do we catch them? The opportunities right. with people like us are there. Can government bring them together? Can someone help us to get in touch with them? Who are those people? Uh, you know, and rather than allowing them to go somewhere else, you know, we have the capabilities, we have the, uh, the best brains, we have the uh, now some amount of infrastructure, I would say, not really infrastructure, <laughs> but we have I some amount of infrastructure. I and understand. Uh, uh, Indians have uh, a lot of initiative as well. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. That was really quick and precise. I mean, uh, closing remarks, Mr. Raj Gopal. Uh, I think uh, I see uh, if if the pharma industry, uh, particularly those who are engaged in promotion to the Indian medical community, there can be a huge opportunity for a disruptive style of promotion of the products. This is something that I personally am very passionate, but I don't have the technology support to. The way, if you see typically how a pharma product gets promoted in the in the Indian in Indian culture, you will find medical representatives. We have a large team of people sitting across the country today. Uh, as Dr. Naram said, there no doctor is meeting the sales team. That means new business development has come to almost a complete halt. If all, the doctor yes. is already familiar with your drug, he he or she prescribes, or the patient goes and buys uh, based on the previous prescription. So new business development, uh, despite uh, you know, if you say all the chemist shops are open for all these days, but uh, no one was giving the access. Doctors are meeting the medical reps with a barge pole and not meeting. So <laughs> that is where, yeah, you know, we have our team members knocking the doors, but you know, they are shooed off. Uh, so are the patients who, who come. Now, coming to the thing, disruptive technology can come into play and can make a huge difference in the cost of running a pharma company. The biggest cost is in the sales force. If there is a platform by which which the doctors agree to participate, then they can have time like the way we are doing today. You know, uh, otherwise we could have had a physical interaction. We would have traveled to Delhi here and there. Very this correct. technology can be brought in, and a lot of le legal elements can be built in where the sales process can be digitized. That means the doctors Excellent. save time, patient, the medical reps save time in waiting in front of the clinics. You can see how difficult the life is. So productivity can go up in a massive way and the, particularly for the small MSME companies who can't compete with large pharma companies on this very aspect of accessing the doctors. The other and thing is uh, uh, permission, more regulated permissions for distribution of uh, drugs. You know, that would be central or you're talking about the state? Uh, distribution? Yeah. Permissions, permissions. Yeah, permissions need to get, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about the first part of the disruptive technology, we're having doctors coming. I think that's more of acceptance by the medical community have, of having this as a platform. Uh, I think doctors are doing webinars today. Uh, they are doing telemedicine. It's just one more step, you know, getting into the process of uh, interacting with the sales, uh, you know, getting to know of new things through our, our reminders through a digital platform. Uh, technology is not difficult. It's more of conceptual change and that can bring Maybe we, we will get together on that and we will take that forward because we've done something internally um, in order to reach um, a, a lot of people, a lot of other groups connected with the entrepreneurs. So maybe we can help you in that. Now, la uh, quick last words, you know, Sushma ji has been poking me on my mobile uh, from Vinodji, the, one, one point. for the closing remarks. One point I want to put across, Vinodji. Yeah, 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 yeah I'll, I'll come to you. Let, let, oh. let uh, Dr. Naram complete. And then yeah. we will go last with you. Dr. Naram, are you there? Just unmute. Yeah. Okay. So my last remarks will be only this that, you know, in my opinion, every entrepreneur uh, is uh, a breed 
which can uh, which has such a strong urge to thrive and survive that i am sure everybody has found in this difficult time uh, how to survive by cutting the corners by finding hidden opportunities of creating sales so i would just say that uh, uh, keep it up in future if whenever the, uh, the there is a revival of everything normal remember that these are the expenses that we were doing which was not productive and don't start them again for example <laughs> i have abandoned having a office <laughs> completely and i'm going to, it is my own office i'm going to rent it out which will generate 5 lakhs of rent per month for me <laughs> and from there i i'm i'm going to pay to my my staff for now and then later on of course it will be extra income but cool. and we have we have created found this uh, hidden pillars where uh, video consultation all over the world uh, training the doctors but through the webinar that was the second tool we could find and in fact through that we found a lot of doctors who would like to uh, prescribe the product so that was uh, the outflow of that you know so there are a lot of i did like several uh, professional webinars uh, all world over having thousand doctors involved in that aware. i'm aware of you, you invited yeah. us for one of those yes A exactly so that's why you know the thing is that you will find you found hidden uh, pillars of uh, cash flow in your own business just think how you will expand and make it as a strategic cash flow pillar beside what you were doing when everything was normal that's what i would actually conclude as a thing i mean there is always easy to say government should help and i always say if it is it is up to me and if government help is there great it is added advantage but <laughs> <laughs> we, we are so motivated by that believe me but nobody told us to start a business we did it on our own we did it for us completely <laughs> <laughs> excellent so i'll i'll move on to Dr. mr jain rahul last quick last words from you okay uh, i very honestly i agree with what dr anup prakash uh, said and i would just want to second that with the just very few bullet points one is that government needs to go into consultation with the industry which does not happen very good so what happens is that uh, there are there are already so many trade bodies so many of them that we need to probably cut them down a little and create one one specific body for specific groups which is in constant consultation they are, they have some road maps let's say some review plans where they uh, they get down to the basic problems and on the other hand they try and find some opportunities for for that particular industry and on the other hand it is for the industry to you know ramp itself up to the global standards because over here there are two things get, that that are going to help uh, us you know be uh, get out of this problem and be one of the leaders one is that we need to increase the range of the products uh, while skilling ourselves into them but still we need to raise the raise the uh, the range of the products and secondly innovate innovate I mean, uh, while while cost cutting and economies of scale they can help you increase your uh, your uh, your bottom lines uh, by uh, fractionally but innovations actually are what something that helps you in multiples so this is where we need to focus and those trade bodies can actually help you talk about nascom i mean what was it industry 4 years before nascom was formed uh, it was maybe maybe a difference of uh, let's say a 25 million dollar industry getting on to uh, and let's say a 70 million dollar industry 4 years prior but once nascom was formed the 4 years pre, uh, after nascom there was an increase of around, roughly on 500% growth in it exports so it's not so over here i agree with what uh, dr arun prakash said that government hand holding is required i would not say i mean i completely am energized by what dr uh, naram said that and it really is uh, is is the key point that yes the fo core focus is on us but we need that government support now chinese were helped by currency manipulation they were hurt, helped by huge export subsidies export subsidies that, yes i mean if we keep on filling the pit i mean are we going to build something over it or are we just we want to reach uh, spend our lives uh, filling a making a foundation and not the building so i mean we need some uh, support center and over here i would really suggest let's say you know people like uh, people from the industry experienced people from the industry let's say maybe a person like you you who could be there Uh, as one key body that ministry of uh, that ministry identifies 
and then you know focused work goes on in a proper professional manner that's what i my agree you would i agree in fact rahul let me also share with all my friends here there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the last 3 years that we have helped who were basically manufacturing in india but today have plants all over the world wow. and they are doing business all over the world so for the indian entrepreneur who is extremely resilient has a lot of patience has Sorry. a vision has is innovative the world is his oyster absolutely so we we need to keep on looking outside and you know of the two cases that i personally have you know uh, sushma ji knows about this one in poland and one in uk extremely successful and with they owning less than 49% of the other company business there today they are into a billion dollar club so that is the outlook that we need to have so if india is not able to you know come up to the uh, i i would say the manufacturing ecosystem or you feel there are issues here or there we can still use india as a market but does not have to be that you know we we have to continue be uh, and also explore a lot of states my feeling is a lot of states have great ecosystems which we don't even know about so we because we are firmly and constant one state so we keep on sticking to that state and base our entire business or factory or manufacturing operation there so that is another very important thing to look at when you are actually looking at broad basing your operations with that so i know of sales matter yes Open absolutely economies of sales matter absolutely yeah. but uh, sushma ji i am through you are you are welcome to come in and take it forward thank you for the fifth message i just received it <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry we went overboard, but it was so you know nice thank listening you. to all this positive stuff. You know, people thank who you. have gone through all sorts of challenges and come out of that. You know, and all of them have a you know smile on their face, and that's what we want to, all the MSMEs of India to have. So despair not. That is the crux of this entire thing. Don't despair. Fight it out. Let us look at more people joining in with you. Together we can we can we can do anything possible. Thank you very much. I wanted to just uh, thank uh, this esteemed panel for these really valuable insights. I'm sure all of our entrepreneurs and viewers have also um, uh, taken a lot of uh, interesting points on how to reorient their business and keep them afloat. In fact, uh, I'm very glad to mention here that all these uh, esteemed panelists are on our mentor panel of India SME Forum. and uh, you can connect with them on mentorforum.org so for any kind of queries they'll all be there to help you in any way or handhold other entrepreneurs in any way i will talk about the mentor forum a little later but since we are behind by 15 minutes i'm going to introduce the third panel now and i'm going to bring in third panelist a third uh, group in uh, may i invite uh shri radhe sham choyal owner shri vishwakarma es industries private limited mr harsh jain ceo dnv food products private limited mr naresh pagaria md pagaria foods mr anam sharma vice president coca cola india and shri manoj murarka director manishankar oils private limited the session would be moderated by by dr reni van berkel so over to you reni uh thank you susma and uh, indeed uh, we we move on to the panel on uh, food systems we we had two earlier panels i think the the hardcore manufacturing where we started is probably uh uh one of the more difficult ones then uh, the pharma uh, health and so on is one where new opportunities were opening up and i think uh, perhaps uh, food is somewhere in the, in the middle uh, in between this uh, spectrum that there are certainly uh, opportunities but uh, mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand there's also some challenges around that so uh, i won't take uh, too much time to introduce i would rather like to ask our panelists to uh, to make uh, uh, brief uh, remarks uh, maybe 3 4 minutes and it's uh, to to comment on what they see as in the food sector the opportunities and the challenges moving forward so i'll start with mr choyal from the shri viswa karma foods yeah thank you dr bakel and uh, i would like to uh, wish a, a good day and uh, congratulations on the international msme day and uh, i also 
congratulate all my fellows MSME sisters and brothers on uh, this MSME day. And uh, if we see, if we talk about the challenges and strength uh, and the opportunities in food sector, first uh, uh, I would like to talk about the challenges we are facing in the food industry as uh, the COVID period is going on. So every every scenario, every war uh, time or every uh, pandemic time has its own opportunity, own challenges. So it's our mindset what we have to focus on. So if you focus on the challenges, uh, the main challenge in the food sector is uh, the regional food taste in, in India because every every part of India has its own food habits, own uh, taste. So we have to cope up with the dietary changes uh, which come up with the COVID-19. Okay, so so there are uh, many challenges as well as there are many uh, opportunities also there. So if we if we talk about the uh, uh, strength or the opportunity, we can we can uh, also mind the challenges. Like uh, if there is one challenge about if I talk about uh, the food uh, processing machine manufacturers, they they have a, a lack of mindset to invest more in technology as well as uh, Indian food buyers uh, lack of uh, awareness of the hygiene quality hygiene in the uh, product. So there is a lacking in the uh, mindset of the good quality and good hygiene. But COVID has an uh, opportunity to give the focus on hygiene and the quality. So nowadays uh, in our industry, in our trade, we are demanding more uh, techno savvy uh, products, more techno savvy uh, plant uh, operations. So this is the opportunity uh, made by the COVID-19. So if we if we talk about the strength, we have a, a second largest population in the world. So we have a huge demand for the food in India. So now government is also uh, trying to handhold the MSME in the food sector. They are giving so many uh, subsidies and uh, any other things. So now this is the time to convert uh, ourselves as a innovators, convert ourselves as a good technologies uh, creators. And food industry is a is a uh, is that industry and it cannot be avoided at any point of time. So we we are into a very good business. What we are uh, seeing nowadays are trained into changing the business, diversifying the business. People are uh, want to more. Uh, come into the food sector. So food sector by the manufacturing or processing of the foods or manufacturing the machines or food processing uh, articles or uh, plant and machinery or turnkey solutions. We have a very good opportunity now. And uh, uh, now people are uh, talking about the uh, post pandemic time, uh, what we will do, but it is the right time to do innovation it is the right time to make uh, updated our technologies we can use uh, artificial intelligence we can use virtual reality we can use the data analysis so this is the right time uh, i uh, 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 request my fellow msme brothers and sisters this is the right time to invest in uh, technology this is the right time to invest uh, in uh, human resource as well as uh, uh, we can diversify our business by many other uh, dietary plan change requirements. Like if I uh, make an example, uh, in post uh, in in COVID nineteen, people has advised to consume less white flour. So there is certainly a huge uh, demand increase in the other type of multigrain demand flours and any other things. People are consuming less pasta and less white flour articles, but they want more immunity items. So there is a certain uh, things are there. We have a very good opportunity in uh, food sector. In agro, we are the largest producer of many agro commodities, but we lack into the cleaning, the post harvesting processes, uh, good processing houses we are lacking. So uh, with the help of government, with the help of our mentors, uh, we should uh, focus on post harvesting activities also so we can generate more income to our farmers as well. So, so okay. uh, yeah, please go on. 
Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So you see an opportunity. So part is dietary change. So people want more immune products. Uh, part is already the challenge of the of the different tastes around the the different cuisines around India, which is I I guess is also an opportunity for diversification value adding. But you overall also see the the opportunity to invest in in, in products on technology and innovation. And indeed, uh, I could could mention that uh, that India is one of the countries with the lowest degree of food processing uh, if you compare internationally. So so there is a huge opportunity which is not limited but was essentially existing before COVID came to us. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank you very much Mr. Koyal. I would like to move on to Mr. Jane from uh, DMV Food Products. So can we have your perspectives on uh, kind of opportunities and challenges for the food sector? Yes, good afternoon everyone and thank you Sushma Ji for giving me this opportunity to be in one of the panelists of this food system and this program. Thank you, doctor, for giving this, giving me this opportunity as well. If you see, India is a country where food is one of the major thing, major thing in the country, and it's never seen a downward trend at all. During, even during the COVID time, if you see, the food is the sector which have grown continuously. There is no break or no stopping. Sky is the limit for you in food sector. But at the same time, there are many challenges which we usually face in this food system altogether. Like before COVID, if you see the transport system, which is there in India, which is very unorganized, which hampers a lot for our uh, supply of materials across, across the country or globally, anywhere. The transport in transport, people are not very well aware how to handle the food properly. Like the hygienes are not maintained, uh, there are lack of awareness of handling the food. So there are and challenges in the sense, like in during COVID, if you see, we faced a lot of challenge in terms of availability of labor, getting permissions from the authorities. Getting permission was one of the major things. Most important thing was the uh, threats which were there or the issues which were there arising every day on day relating to COVID. So everyone was really scared whether to start their business, continue the business or not. But we took up this challenge and we continued giving our services across India, across the globe, wherever we were serving. And we had done, done this across everywhere. So this was one of the toughest challenges which we faced during the last two or three months. And we continuously tried to overcome this challenge and we went on doing whatever possible. In fact, if you see to motivate our employees or the staff, even we personally went to our factories to the points where it was required to motivate all the people everywhere so that they can also work. And we took all the measures which were required to help them uh, peace, uh, get the peace of mind and continue the working. So one of the major things uh, in food system, if you see the infrastructure, India needs to work a lot on infrastructure. Infrastructure in the terms of transportation, which I said, which is one of the major things. Then there is the, uh, if you see the food corporation of India, which is there, the food corporation of India, the supply, they need to purchase more products and keep storing those products and giving these products to retailers and wholesalers at a price which is very well versed with the market so that this keeps on uh, keep uh, this help us in uh, reducing the price or no, not letting the other people raise the prices of the products. Some of the other factors like the fair price shop, which is a very good initiative by the government. So this fair price shop should be more motivated across India so that people can people be encouraged to buy the products from them. So this was one of the uh, two or three challenges which is there across. If we work on this to improve the system, then the food the food industry or the people who are there in this food segment, they know sky is the limit. Even during the COVID time, if you see there were people, we, uh, it was never like we never had any demand. If the demand was surplus, but the supply was an issue. And we kept on working on with the supply and day by day, the supply improved. And even today, when there's a fear of COVID, people are still uh, moving out of their houses, out of their comfort zone and trying to supply the food across India. So this is one of the major thing which was there during the COVID. And uh, in order to improve the system across India, the middlemen which are there from the farmer point of view till the retail point, they should be eliminated. If we uh, connect the farmers directly with the retail or the wholesalers, then the prices will be controlled a lot. That will help all across for us to reduce the prices and then we can have a good supply, good system, everything will be implemented. And uh, some of the major things which we say uh, during these challenges where there were shortage, uh, if you see across India, there are shortage of food grains. 
and uh, india should implement some of the strategies so that the food production can be improved uh, there are many places where we see the uh, there are many extra stocks which are there but there are no care taken how to store those stocks so we have to put proper process to identify the excess production which is there across india and how to handle that excess product so that the prices can be controlled otherwise if what happens when the products are not properly stored it get damages it get damages and the prices are necessary rise kept on rising so these are the okay. major challenges i think which we are facing during the covid okay. situation and in this food system thank you thank you so uh, a part of it is the uh, the 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 whole uh, logistics and distribution so the high losses which are happening in the distribution system or quality losses at least and then you had the specific challenges for covid and also motivating your workers which we've also heard from other places so getting the confidence that workers come back to work in the factories so thank you very much for that i would like to move on to mr pagaria from pagaria foods uh, can i have your uh, thoughts please yeah uh, thank you everybody um uh, thank you especially uh, the sme forum and dr rene for giving us an giving me an opportunity to present my views on the uh, international uh, international msme day um, on food food safety food security and food systems uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be a part of this expert panelist and uh, i would like to highlight few things you know i would like to place my points in two different uh, uh, two different uh, groups like one what we can do as industrialist and other one is what uh, government can do and i think i will always take the first uh, thing on us i think we as industrialists we have fought all our battles uh, together and i'm sure that would be the ideal way to start now what i want is uh, uh, if, if you look at uh, like rightly said by mr harsh also that food is the basic need nobody can stay without that and it has been proved again during this time food and pharma both have supported uh, to the supplies during the pandemic period and the pandemic period has also given us an i think it is given us an opportunity to present what we are as food industrialists in the country we have we have all striven hard to see that supplies are efficiently done and i think in the coming days it gives us a uh, much more opportunities also now uh, what are the things that we as industrialists can do i think going further i think with the way india has been projected now in the world uh, post pandemic and also with the new government the way they are working i think we as industries have a lot of opportunity when it comes to exports especially indian brand brand india has taken an another level i think we as industrialists can play very hard in a very good way to take us and reach next level in our food products exporting to many foreign countries this is one very big opportunity and for doing that what are the things that we need to do i think we have to focus a lot on our hygiene on quality on innovation and we all we have the right infrastructure infrastructure right opportunity for us on that and uh, just to tell you a few things you know we are into manufacturing of food products where we do breakfast cereals masalas spices and in all these sectors down 5 6 years back we had no uh, much market export in exports but today we are available in almost 15 countries of the world even up to america we have started export i just gave you my example but then this is the opportunity available to all of us uh, in the in, in the fraternity today india's image globally has gone a different level uh, and just to highlight this point you know i remember 10 years back when we 9 years back when we actually started exports we were not looked upon well when we were you know we were there in exhibition but today it is not so if there is a, if, if we are using the word made in india people come to our stand europeans americans all come to our stand and they say oh good nice to see breakfast cereals from an from an indian uh, food company and i think that's an opportunity uh, likewise it could be on many other things yes health wise there's a lot of focus and i think we another we have to focus a lot on this pandemic has given an opportunity and a challenge to all of us to uh, make and things which are more immune uh, based uh, more health based that's another area and also i feel uh, the vocal for local whatever uh, i mean it, it it's not just about uh, an and localized product but i think it's an opportunity for us to prove what as local companies we can do globally so i think that's another opportunity we as industrialists can work on and uh, apart from that 
what I would like to tell you is I think uh, technology. I think this is another one factor which I really feel we as industrialists have to use mandatorily. There are various factors. I think Mr. Choyal gave a lot of uh, details on that. I just want to tell that if we have to go to the next level as industries, technology and software and things like that yeah, uh, has to be adopted and brought into the daily working of our companies. These are the few points from our side as industrialists. Now, one from the government side. See, whatever said and done, without government support it's really difficult really really i won't say impossible but then it's it's a big enabler and here i would like to uh, highlight points on how the government should play a role especially in the food industries because as rightly pointed out by mr hirsch lot i mean i was told the last data is around 60 percent of our vegetables and fruits are getting wasted i mean it's a serious national waste can we do something about it Yes, we can do. One of my suggestions there is, I think we have to highlight on the infrastructure there, like cold storages and better storage systems and better management of, of the thing, which government can help us initially to develop and later on private sector can take over because it needs huge investment. The second part is they have done, this new government is doing few things, few more, much more things are needed. Like they have done, uh, a bit of thing like like I saw yesterday, Karnataka government announcing any new industries coming in does not need any licenses for while they start their work. So it's a good thing, you know, because uh, with a single window clearance, they can do it. And within the next three years, they can take all the licenses. I think it's a, this is a very good move. And like this, there are so many other things. And one more step which I would have to appreciate, the APMC Act, I think all my uh, fellow panelists in the food line will appreciate with the with the removal of the APMC Act, a lot of things are going to change and it will help us reach directly to the vendor from the farmer to the ultimate consumer. I think there have been two, three steps and there has, there has to be a lot of things like this to do. Uh, one of them, I think one of the low cost funding. I think as industry, we are having, we are not having a fair play compared to other industries in other countries of the world. Here, if they can be doing, doing something would help a lot. Finally, what I would like to conclude my uh, points here is that it's a good opportunity for us as industrialists. India is well placed, even though, yes, we are going through very, very tough time due to pandemic. But I think post another three months, we can come out very well. I'm sure we as Indian industrialists can prove a lot and will prove and show to the world. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Pagaya. Yeah, uh, I think you you clearly highlight. Uh, uh, let's not always hand uh, put our hands open and wait for government to help us. Let's uh, look inside what we can do, what we can do in terms of uh, technology innovation, product diversification, be innovative, be entrepreneurial. After all, uh, because entrepreneurial is also about taking uh, calculated risks, uh, seeking opportunities, and so on. So be more entrepreneurial. But at the same time, there are also constraints uh, which are more in the supply chain logistics and uh, government clearance of ease of doing business where government can play a role and uh, once these enabling factors are there then business can flourish again so thank you very much for that I would like to go to Mr. Sharma from uh, Vice President for Coca-Cola India to have also a little bit of a perspective from a, a larger play because I, I don't think uh, Coca-Cola, we can put them in the MSME segments but uh, you deal of course with a lot of MSMEs so uh, Mr. Sh um, Mr. Sharma, please, uh, your comments, please. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Rene. Uh, pleasure talking to you. Of course, this is virtual. Uh, my great congratulations to all my co-panelists uh, on this big day, uh, World SMSME Day. Uh, congratulations. Uh, one small correction. Uh, uh, my designation is not vice president. I think there was some uh, okay. gap. So nonetheless uh, i i'm i'm work i work for coca cola and i have a perspective around what uh, you know my co panelists have already covered here these are very opportune time if i can say uh, how i see uh, like so many things have changed and this atmanir bharat debate and this journey has all there were there were uh, calls made in the past also towards this effect however the times are now very very opportune for us a lot of things have changed uh, even in the recent past which obviously the covid shadow we are still under it uh, other than that i see a lot of uh, you know reforms in terms of uh, uh, you know tax reforms so to say which could have direct bearing on anybody's business 
be it gst be it corporate tax reforms very recent ones and of course uh, the direction which government has taken in the space of agriculture so definitely the opportunity is immense and that can be coupled with the fact that this whole idea is around a population which is i think a substantial amount of uh, customers are just next door uh, for any sme or for whatever is india is a big market here so now uh, having uh, said this background this opportunity uh, obviously can lead us to a better future together and it's an opportunity to participate uh, and take a sustainable approach so uh, i was hearing uh, all all the sessions previously so uh, somebody mentioned uh, from the farmer side uh, that this is not a day's job that you can switch it on and you can come back or you can perform when the need arises so there's a lot of uh, back backroom work uh, he mentioned about 10 years 20 years uh, speed work they have already done and they could deliver uh, and they could rise to the occasion so uh, i think that is the approach where we have to go uh, if we have to look to a longer and sustainable uh, business and opportunity in global supply chain so that's one so it has to be a journey uh, and a promise it has to be a promise of a brand uh, even if you want to tap to a global supply chain regime, you have to be consistent, you have to be dependable, and uh, that promise, that value, and that uh, purpose around, uh, because uh, in global supply chains are not only around economics of it. At times, they uh, look for something bigger than that. That could be the purpose of the company, the ethics, the human value, the the kind of you know the kind of practices. Uh, sustainability definitely is becoming a big big. Is going to be big, and as as a large corporation, we see this happening. So uh, even uh, uh, post COVID, pre COVID, uh, we have to see that few things will change for better, and uh, people will demand certain kind of foods. And while we try to embed ourselves, uh, you have to keep people, you have to keep purpose, and you have to uh, keep shared value for communities where you operate in as a central piece of the puzzle. So just I would like to touch upon uh, Coca-Cola in this uh, uh, scenario. We happen to be, uh, maybe uh, most of the people would be knowing it, uh, uh, though we are not a, a local company, but I think by all means we can, uh, as it can be, we are, I think, local. 95% and in some cases 99%, what I'm saying is a range, whether it's our ingredient sourcing, whether it's our uh, people, whether these are uh, partners who manufacture, who, uh, who franchise bottling partners, everything is to the tune of 95 to 99% locally, local source, local people, local communities we work through. So uh, that's the promise Coca-Cola. And, and I think this is not a, a new company, it's uh, in uh, being for over 134 years. And th that's the core of it. So we uh, see it as a core of it and that's what i uh, can a small uh, bit of uh, you know experience we can share obviously the world is big and this opportunity is even bigger and this is the timing was also very right so i this is i think my initial thoughts i i'll pause here and then maybe uh renee if anything comes later on i can address and comment there yes uh, thank you very much, Anam. I, th I think you you put it uh, sort of a way as almost I would say Coca-Cola as an aggregator of many uh, MSMEs and enabler for many a MSME ecosystem uh, around you to deliver the the Coke and the other drinks in the in the store and the other products. I think you also highlighted clearly the the enormous agribusiness and related opportunity, but also the challenges. So if you look at land use, water, uh, all the issues there, and I think uh, I, I, you also mentioned the. Uh, briefly the the kind of sustainability expectations so what i where where is your product coming from so it's not is it the, the right taste and the right quality but how has it been made and quality getting a much broader interpretation in that so people are interested in the provenance of the whole uh, product uh, more and more as people get also a bit more affluent in, in certain areas so thank you very much i go to the uh, last panelist for first introduction so mr dr Ma manosh muraka from uh, management Manish Hankar Oils. So Indian pronunciation is sometimes a little bit difficult, but Mr. Muraka, please, uh, your comments, please. Good afternoon to all of all, sir. And wish you a happy MSME day to all my panelists and all the audience. So today in our fight with the, this deadly Corona COVID-19, the only weapon we have is our self-humanity. 
and we have put everything on the stake for our health, be it economics or entertainment or relation or election. So the main point is to develop our Im immunity, we require good food. And India has been always been a land of good food. We had a big opportunity, tremendous opportunity in the coming post COVID area for the good food. Uh, in last few decades, uh, we have actually uh, forgotten the Indian food system and we have substituted with the fast food. In this period, in the coming period, the challenge with the food industries will be to serve the good food in the form of fast food. So this will be a big challenge. Secondly, is my, my opinion is that we have to educate the consumer about the good food. Today, we are using the word natural or herbal. Natural doesn't mean that it can be edible or pure doesn't mean that it can be healthy food. So we have to educate the, uh, our consumer related to all this, but there should be a government policy change also because in government policies, they have taxed all the food items in the same category. For example, if you take for the edible oils, they have taxed all the edible oils in the same category. We got to explain to the government that we have to promote the good food and if we required healthy food, that should be taxed in the lower tax level. So this is all because, um, my suggestion and rest of the things has been discussed by the other panelists. So my point is that the education to the consumer is one of the important things which food industries need to do. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, and I think it's a, it's a very valid point that there has been a tendency to fast food and uh, and and so on, and uh, we we have lost a little bit track on what's healthy food and healthy food or good food is uh, of course what we want. We want uh, good nutrition, people to be uh, have a healthy habit, healthy food, uh, and that will help the the nation forward to in that sense. Uh, so thank you very much for that uh, comments. We we don't have much time, but still I would like to come back maybe to each of the panelists with a short uh, answer, maybe to a question because. We, we have seen also the social fabrics changing a little bit. We've seen the reverse migration and people have seen that uh, basically you could say it from a skills perspective, maybe some skills have come back to regional areas and rural areas. So is there an opportunity uh, to actually build on uh, um, the food systems, which I have to start in agriculture or in fisheries, with the uh, the reverse migration that has come there. So maybe I can go back. Is there some some thoughts on the on how can we capture the fact that there's there's skill semi-skilled workers back in some communities to pick up the agriculture and the agribusiness uh, side. So can I just go back to Ms., maybe Mr. Choyal first? Yeah. Uh, I will uh, conclude my talk and my closing session uh, just by a few words. Uh, I just say we are proud MSME and we have shown our guts to survive in any conditions. So we have the guts to make our nation proud. We have the guts to make uh, good opportunities from this uh, period. So I would like congratulate to all of my MSME uh, fellow partners and the uh, panelists as, as well as the participants and the Dr. Barkel and the uh, ISF team, the UNIDO team, uh, Mr. Vinod and uh, Mrs. Shushma. Uh, all we together can do anything. We are proud MSME and will make it happen again and make it India, made in India a pride subject. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Jane. Maybe something on the the opportunity in the uh, rural areas. Yes, if you see food itself is a very big opportunity for India as of now, as it's a developing country, and our prime minister is focusing a lot on uh, Atmanirbhar or making it India self reliant. So if you see, like food is a uh, food is a system in which we can improvise a lot. Like my co-panelist said, Mr. Mr. Manoj said that healthy foods are very much important. So I would like to add that healthy foods, like India, lack nutrition in their food. So once, in, like, in, if you improvise on the nutrition of food, then it can improvise all over India the health or perspective of the people. If you see in Saudi Arabia in 1978, they have made it mandatory to uh, mandatory to mix iron, folic acid, and vitamin A to the feed floor which have improvised the health of the people. So food system is a thing in which if we work on the nutritional value 
and how to improvise on the nutrition or the food perspective in india it can it can help in growing people much more healthy and making india a better place so health is the word which is connected much very much with the food system so healthy food right very rightly said is very much important in india and in india we are we can really improvise on this so okay yeah thank you so much for this i think health and food goes hand in hand okay thank you very much uh, mr pakaria uh, um, would you take on a, a final uh, comment please mr pakaria pardon uh, i hope you are able to hear yes yes now we can hear you yes okay okay so my continuing my points what i would like to add on is that uh, there is one element in the, after the pandemic there's a lot of skill delay a lot of labor demographics have changed so a lot of uh, people from their natives have they gone back to their own places <clears throat> so which also means that a lot of farming activity will restart this is my guess in certain state because there's a lot of migration of labor that has happened in the last few months in india because uh, you know states the few states where the people have moved in a lot of uh, to other states for work now they have all gone back to native now what does it mean to us to me it looks that this is an opportunity where agriculture should get a better boost now because yeah. a lot of people have gone back to their rural areas and if that can really be taken over because i was also hearing to our honorable minister mr nitin gadkari they are telling us that that could be an opportunity where the migrants will start working on agriculture so where agriculture was getting ignorant or was not taken full full fledged activity i think that gets having a big boost which in turn should help in giving getting better quality products from the farmland and this yes. will help the food processing industry a lot and yeah. also to add just one more point to that is that now a lot of localites should start working in the industry which also is a good step according to me uh going down the line it'll take some time to get measured up but then overall my conclusion is that with the improvement in agriculture or overall our food products also should get into a next level up okay thank you i think i think what you emphasize on agriculture could be extended also then on the cold <laughs> storage uh initial processing and receiving because i think ultimately the the quality is the the, the weakest quality will determine the weakest cha uh, chain in the belt will come determine so i go to mr sharma uh some thoughts on the the regional opportunity really a few thoughts around it uh how i see this uh uh, uh this would be again uh, i just want to give a trivia coca cola is one of the largest if not the largest buyer of agri commodities in india including mango pulp so we are the largest mango pulp buyer uh, in india and that too for india and of course we export also because mango happens to be very uh, local fruit and not widely available so we, we take it to worldwide but we happen to be the largest buyers uh so that's our claim to being agriculture and, and of course food processing is logical extension of uh, agriculture so how we see in our company uh, this opportunity it was always there it's not that that it has come now we call it fruit circular economy so in 2016 we had committed 1.7 billion usd under a csr initiative called fruit circular economy initiative so there were two parts to that so uh backward and forward just to alluding to your point so uh, by let's say i'll pick on the backward part of it so the backward was actually towards taking the yields of that particular fruits or horticulture varieties uh, to a next level so just to uh, a case in point we are running a project under the banner unnati apple project in uttarakhand a uh, hilly state of um, india so uh, the idea is to take the yield of apple the producti productivity to 5x this is not a joke 5x yeah. and uh, the second element of it is the the yield the first the peak yield comes in the third year itself otherwise the traditionally it will happen in seventh or tenth year so uh, and this all csr and while i'm making this statement it's our third year into that intervention and we are already seeing the fruits we are doing the good work uh, under the radar silently and the change is happening and we have seen this uh, journey we have uh, done this already in the uh, mango in south 
so uh, i see it from both sides so obviously it has to be full circle so you take it from agriculture and obviously rural is a market for sure there is no doubt about it so on that part also uh, we have a responsibility to come up with innovation we have to bring out those products so we have a, a, a fruit a juice range uh, minute made under the brand minute made which has master flagship brand we have hyper localized so for example we have done some experiments uh, for example kesar mango which is a very very uh, niche mango in gujarat so we have yes. uh, done, done some innovation around those or uh, some other kind of mangoes some so that so we have a role i see as a food processing a role having backwards okay. and forwards so full circle yes. so we have to see in a circular approach so that's my take okay. on that okay thank you very much then i go uh, last uh, back to mr uh, muraka maybe some uh, 30 second closing comments Yes, sir, sir. Uh, what I believe is basically in India, the food industries have a very big opportunity. And MSME, I says manufacturing sector with maximum employment. We have a scarcity of food. Means although we are manufacturer, we are the producer of um, highest producer of many agri commodity, but still we have certain scarcity of many food. So if newcomers want to come in this field, so it will be great for them. And if they come with the good and healthy food, this will be a very big opportunity for them. And this is the opportunity which will be continue for coming centuries and centuries. This is all uh, what I want to say. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for uh, highlighting uh, different uh, aspects of the food systems. And I would also maybe uh, pull it back to UNIDO, which I represent here. So UNIDO as the industrial development organization is very interested in working in the food processing chain and for setting up better food systems. We have work ongoing on energy efficiency, for example, in the, in the dairy sector, in the rice milling, in tea sector. Uh, we are working on, on better cooling systems and uh, so that we have less loss in the, in the milk supply to the dairies or in the distribution areas. But I think that also the opportunities there around food diversification and food quality and nutritional value. So I really look forward to uh, take this discussion forward with uh, ISF, India SME Forum and some of the manufacturers to see how we can really drive uh, food systems in India to higher productivity, innovation, quality and healthy nutrition for the nation. So thank you very much. I would like to hand over back to uh, uh, Sushma to take it to the, the, the final panel on uh, finances and markets. Thank you, Rene. That was a lovely session and uh, it kept us wanting more. So, uh, <laughs> so there are so many things to be discussed. Uh, before I introduce the closing panel, one uh, thing I would like to mention to all our esteemed panelists here, everybody spoke about brand India and made in India. In fact, I would like to urge all my uh, co-entrepreneurs uh, and uh, entrepreneur members that let us all start working on the brand made best in India. So, you know, I mean, uh, we could make products which are made best in India and nowhere in the world. So with that, uh, I would like to thank all the panelists uh, for the third session. And um, uh, thank you, Rene, for this uh, session. We will connect uh, up, um, uh, during the closing panel. Uh, for your thank you words as well uh, when we come uh, uh, towards uh, concluding the, the session. So thank you once again. And uh, I would like to introduce the closing panel on mending finance, finances and markets. May I invite uh, Mr. Siddharth Razdan, founder India Nivesh, first bridge fund, Sri Tilak Raj Bajalia, former DMD of SIDBI and also board member of India SME Forum. Sri Santosh Singh, head energy and climate change in Telecap. And uh, we will be shortly joined by Mr. Hilvendra Mathur, partner Bharat Innovations Fund. The session will be moderated by uh, Shri Vinod Kumar, Honorary President of India SME Forum. Over to you, Vinod, sir. Uh, Vinod, sir, do we have you? Thank you, Sushma Ji. It is, uh, it's been a wonderful day. And uh, uh, I'm amazed that this is the longest session that has ever run. <laughs> We've been four hours and on it. 
and uh, thank you to all the guys that have stayed on in the social media also and in, inside the webinar room also for holding on and uh, trying to gauge what exactly is happening uh, with the successful and enterprises and you know knowledge is the most important thing to actually be able to uh, you know upgrade your business and upgrade your own uh, best practices uh, today's panel this last panel is primarily on finances and how is it that we are able to uh, put together uh, two aspects of it. The first aspect is, as far as MSMEs go, there's a lot of things that ne they need to do in order to firm up their financial position, customer base, their doc documents, and so on and so forth. And then the second part of it is, how can the present, uh, you know, recovery packages, support, financial support that is available, how can that, um, you know, benefit MSMEs? And is it benefiting SMEs? And if not, what are the, uh, you know, um, probable solutions for this? So I'd like to first go to Santosh and ask him that, what do you think can MSMEs do to firm up their financial position? Thank you, Mr. Uh, and thank you for inviting me for this panel uh, and a warm greeting to all my co-panelists and all the people who are participating and also happy research for the MSME day. Uh, if uh, you allow me, uh, Vinodji, if I can twist your question and see that how rather than what MSME can do, what financial sector can do, um, uh, that would be much more impactful. And I would then that, that, is, that is part two of the question. So that's okay. part two okay. of the question anyway. Okay, so then, then, then we we'll come back it. to it in the second round. <laughs> okay, so so I will highlight one fact. Um, you know, in the op opening session, uh, our honorable minister mentioned about uh, one of the key points that uh, enabling finance to MSME and creating ease of business. That was one of the points mentioned in five actionable points. And uh, how critical is this point? If I want to kind of highlight, is that uh, of the entire credit need that MSME sector has, you know, the the credit gap is something in the range of twenty to twenty-five trillion rupees. Uh, and when I say credit gap, it basically the gap between the formal supply of uh, credit and uh, demand. So uh, there are informal sector institutions scattering to MSME sector. Now, when you are in a sector which is primarily dominated by informal sector uh, credit supply, MSME have a very very kind. Of a demand-led market, supply-led market. So you basically need to go and see that if you fit the bill of a financing institution to get the finance, because there's a limited supply. Now, coming back to the question that you just asked, and I'll get back to uh, the second part later. So the first part is that MSME, one of the things that they need to do, that they have to reassess uh, their financial strategy. And that's very critical because uh, I, you might have hearing tidbits from earlier speakers that how they realized that some of the cost centers were not needed. Uh, some of the growth paths might require a different kind of financing. So have a very, very clear strategy about uh, what kind of financing you require, not only in terms of quantum, but how you're going to finance it. Uh, one of the, uh, those, anyone who has been working with MSME sector, especially, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, micro and small enterprises, their understanding of financial instruments is not that well uh, developed. Sometimes they use very inefficient uh, ways of financing capital because they go for whatever is available. So I would say that one thing is that to clearly uh, have a look at the financing uh, strategy that they have, the growth path they have, and they need to see that whether that growth strategy that they had designed pre-pandemic is still going to be valid. Because that's the first thing, because that would, uh, clearly take them to a, a decision point that, okay, I won't do this, I won't do this, and I need to do this differently. So that's one thing. Uh, second is that uh, this is the time, and I'm especially talking about uh, the uncertainty and the uh, pandemic has caused or certain kind of uncertainty that pop up, which are not uh, as big as like this, but they are very sectoral and very geographical. So while this has been overwhelming the global pandemic, but there are several crises that hits the MSME sector, which are more sectoral and confined to a particular geography. And often 
the MSME don't have a pool of capital reserved for that kind of crisis to get out of that. And, 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 and neither do they have access to any kind of institution that can provide them a financing to get over that crisis. Because uh, we have not thought about a crisis financing as of now. Forget about uh, you know having institutions. We have not even realized that we need that. We need so, yes, very good. So, so the two point that I want to say that reassess your strategy. I don't want to get into details for the time sake, but just look at the experts. Look at the experts who have done your strategy. Look at the, your growth projections. Look at the capital requirement. And second, hold on to cash. This is going to be you know your your survival fight. So if you can you know, withhold certain kind of uh, expenditure or reassess them, find a better way of doing that, you can do that. So I'll stop here and I'll come back to the second part whenever you trigger. Excellent. Thank you very much. You know, I'd like to move forward to Siddharth. Siddharth is a very flamboyant financer. He, he is known to speak his mind. So Siddharth, how would you take this question forward? You know, what is it that MSMEs need to do when, uh, you know, when it comes to actually securing or firming up their financial position to, uh, and you know, instead of begging for finance, actually getting finance, what do you think uh, is required? So thank you, Vinod, for this uh, introduction, and uh, I would like to wish everybody, including my co-panelists, we can we, we we can only see your ball plate, or oh, it's getting ball balls. <laughs> we know. Yeah, 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 we can hear you. Yeah, but you, thank you, you very close to the camera. Yeah. So thank you, Vinod, for this uh, opportunity. Pleasure. And also, I would like to wish all my co-panelists and everybody here a happy MSME day. As you're aware that, you know, I have a very different view on, uh, and, you know, a lot has been said about managing your costs and managing your revenues and managing your cash flows. One very single uh, practical piece of advice, which I tell most MSMEs to look at today is what I call uh, look at merger and alliances. Today is an era of cooperation. Uh, which could mean very simple, uh, if you have a branch in, say, in Bangalore and your competitor has a branch in Bangalore, maybe it makes more sense for you to combine and have shared resources. This is one thing which I recommend because, you know, everybody has to take a realistic call on things because one thing is sure, uncertainty is a certainty today. Cash flow uncertainty is also uncertainty today. And perhaps pooling of resources and sharing resources which lead to some amount of consolidation and giving at least uh, some of them a uh, good chance. And also one of the key things which I am recommending today is look at uh, how are small uh, sources of capital outside the traditional, you know, everybody talks about government support and, you know, bank support and everything. While they will come at their own speed, the timing is an issue and there, one has to appreciate that banks are also not working at full capacity today. And there are huge numbers we're talking about. You know, the banking system is also not geared up to process these applications in that volume. So it will take time. One of the key things which I have realized is that a lot of uh, talented uh, people who are either uh, going to be moving out of their jobs globally, okay, especially from the Middle East, a lot of people uh, have lost jobs, people are likely to move back. And also your key employees, you will need to look at uh, converting yourself, uh, you know, them into your soft entrepreneurship. And you should look at your senior employees, uh, you know, taking some equity from them if possible. Not any significant amount. So I'm, I understand that they may also not have the liquidity, but this is an opportunity to identify and create co-partners as well. A lot sure. of talent is going to be globally available. It would be worthwhile to look at tapping them, look at their resource pool, both financial as well as other expertise. I am going to speak on these two very simple things, basic things, rather than you know. I'm sure a lot has been said and spoken and printed about. Uh, the support which banks and uh, the government and uh, other bodies but focus on if possible any way you can raise some amount of equity in any format it is something which should be explored from any source uh, yes. don't look at huge numbers uh, you know uh, every drop becomes an ocean so even a one or two crores so the idea of priority or one line should be to survive 2020 uh, and if you survive 2020 i'm very sure uh, 2021 will be, be, uh, be much better year much, much easier yes very correct. Very correct. I'd like to move on to Hemendra. Uh, Hemendra joined us. I think his other session has got over. So uh, Hemendra, what would you say that you had a fairly large experience with financing small and medium enterprises? So what is it that you would say, you know, they need to do in order to be able to firm up their financial position and uh, be able to, you know, attract funding? 
or you know get more funds thanks thanks for know then uh, thanks for inviting me and apologies to you and other panelists for joining late i was on a cii panel which got extended by five minutes, so i was worried but uh, <laughs> good to be good, good to be here now and uh, very very relevant questions so you know my answer to your question is that uh, you know we should we should make most of this crisis you know you know we should not let this opportunity waste which this crisis has brought to msme sector i want to make two three points uh, to your questions on how to attract capital and foremost degree consumer good uh, msmes what i have seen there that uh, the working capital cycles stretch as much as 90 to 150 days they are too long too long in the context of the margins they make the margins are typically the beta margins i've seen is like single digit margins so you know it's a it's a complete mismatch between the margins and the working capital cycles that you carry with yourself so i think one one thing which most msme should be thinking about in this crisis is focus on value addition i i'm i i I think they leave a lot of money on the table for other new bring in culture of R and D, product development, value addition. I think that should pick big time as far as MSMEs are concerned. Another piece of advice that I have is most MSMEs uh, that are with or probably as part of the universe still continue to be B two B, right? And of course, there are certain business, there's no other option, but I think there are at least few sectors where there's a potential to go B2C as well, right? Uh, so right. I think those those are the areas one should think about. And I think in this post-COVID world, we're going to see much more application of uh, digital uh, uh, applications, which can probably reduce the transaction cost to go directly to the consumer. I think that's one thing to be cognizant of. Um, and I think the consumer behavior is also going to change. So how do we live with a new supply construct? Uh, how do we adopt to that? We should be thinking about that a lot. For example, in food, I can tell you the focus on uh, food safety, the focus on traceability of food is going to go up multiple times. That's going to throw a lot of opportunities for SMEs and, and who are open to adopt to new technology are the ones who are going to win this race. So I think that is one area they should be looking at. Uh, for SMEs which are in manufacturing sector, I think there is enough tech available to, to improve resource efficiency. And when I say resource is essentially labor efficiency, energy efficiency, water efficiency, you say 50 basis point, 30 basis point, but collectively, I think it can help uh, uh, SMEs to log to the cash flows so I think be open-minded, be a little bit more progressive in adopting this solution is extremely important. And the ones who are in services sector, it is a great time. culture of work from home, picking up. I think the, the, the fixed costs around offices and many overhead costs can be reduced. And I think access to talent. Think of an SME in places like Alwar, Karnal, Coimbatore, Khammam. The biggest challenge for them is always how do we hire the best market distribution financial controls. Now, with this virtual world, irrespective where you based, you have the opportunity to hire talent from anywhere. You know, I think so. I think this is going to open uh, a lot of avenue for SMEs to hire good talent. I think that is one thing they should should be looking about. And when you have good talent, good management, it typically drives the governance. I think challenge that I have faced in my private equity time is, is the level of governance in SME. I think that has sort of grow multifold to give any sort of comfort to investors. Uh, so, so as I always say, since I've worked with a lot of startups now, you know, for me, the best combination is the, the governance uh, and the tech orientation of startups and the resilience of SMEs. You know, I think what I like about SME is that good times, bad times, they survive. If we can get Create a, if you can create a combination of these two, this makes a fantastic case for, for any possible investment. Um, so probably I'll stop here. I hope I answered your question. Sir, no, that was, that was precise. That was, that was very focused. I don't know whether you've left anything uncovered for Mr. Bajalia, but I still go, go to Bajalia, sir. Bajalia, sir, I mean, 
uh, you've heard all the viewpoints. There are five uh, uh, panelists, so you've heard four viewpoints. Is there anything that you feel that is uh, not covered yet when it comes to you know your experience of uh, actually uh, funding M MSMEs and getting them to a point where you are able to fund them? Uh, is there anything that is not covered yet that that you feel? No, I I think uh, their points were very valid. And uh, they have covered most of the points. In fact, Mr. Mathur, he is relying more on internal generation Very by good. improving your profitability. And instead of relying on uh, external resources, you rely on your internal resources. But uh, I think as we uh, know that SMEs always face problem of finances. Now, if we uh, take the position of pre-COVID, uh, we were uh, knowing that uh, this lot of industries were uh, facing a lot of problems like automobile sector, ancillary units were getting closed. A lot of units, they were having problems. I feel that maybe COVID might have come to their rescue. Otherwise, they would have become NPA by now. <laughs> okay. So it's a, you, say, you say it's a blessing in disguise in a way. Yeah, yeah. For those, those people, it is blessing in uh, disguise. But uh, uh, if we go by the present situation now, you see this. Uh, the government has come out with a uh, big package of 3 lakh crore rupees. And uh, uh, maybe I still feel that some banks are reluctant to give the collateral free loans. But uh, I think 24 uh, public sector and uh, private sector banks, they have gone ahead and they have sanctioned good amount, 75,000 crores they have sanctioned, out of which uh, around 44% uh, they have disbursed. And uh, even Sidby also out of 30,000, they have sanctioned around uh, 10,000 crore to NBFC for on lending to SMEs. SMEs. Yeah. And we see that uh, perhaps maybe after COVID, now uh, everybody's interest has come in SME. Now Prime Minister is directly involved in SME. They are realizing that if employment is to be provided, if we have to meet immediate requirement of the industry, SME is the segment which we should focus on. And a uh, lot of focus is coming on SME. Every day, if you see that something or the other is working on SME. So uh, I, I think things are going to happen. Maybe I think uh, after COVID, in my opinion, things are definitely going to improve. Maybe the equity fund, now focus is coming on equity fund that 50,000 fund of funds, if we go by that, at least 250,000 crore can be uh, covered under the, that scheme, which other funds also will get involved and give to SMEs. So a uh, good amount is uh, identified for that. And even the scheme, even uh, ministry is insisting that uh, the SMEs who are planning to go to the market, 15% will be coming from this fund, from another fund. So these way things are happening. Banks are uh, becoming aware. Finance ministry is almost every 15, 20 days. She is taking the meeting of uh, heads of the banks and uh, insisting that the disbursement to SME sector should take place. But you see this out of 75 million SME units, so far only 2 million units, they have started the business. They have availed the facility and the gap is huge. And uh, I don't know to what extent this app can be met. They uh, definitely are having huge problems. Now, another problem is that after 31st August, when their repayments becomes due, interest they have funded, but their other repayments will start due. Whether they will be in a position to pay that. And in my opinion, the position is very bad. If we take that six states, larger states, which are contributing more than 50% of the GDP, most of the areas in these states are in red zone. And it will take time. It is, uh, I, in my opinion, it will be beyond August that they will come out of this. So it will be really very, very difficult to start operations in these states or just see that most of the SME units, they start working. As uh, SNP has said that India's uh, GDP will decline by 5%. Perhaps uh, I, I feel that, okay, if it stops at 5%, it, will, it should be okay. Otherwise, the way things are looking, position is not so good. Not so good. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, to taking it forward, there is this uh, 20 lakh crore that you mentioned. 
Do yeah. you feel that everybody in India will get supported by this? Uh, there are a lot of people who are still saying our bank is not offering it. I am only getting 15,000 rupees. I can't even give one, one month salary to somebody. So, you know, this entire support program that was primarily doled out, do you think it is going to be sufficient or we'll have to look at some other mechanism for a long term no. uh, support? When uh, we consider the size of the SME, this amount is nothing. It is very, very small amount. But uh, another, what you said that uh, uh, most of the clients, they are not getting the support from the uh, these banks. That is true also. You see this in private sector banks. Even now, under these circumstances, they are charging 14 to 50 percent on SMEs. While other, they are uh, lending them at 9 percent. HDFC is lending at 8.5 percent. So the cost of funds per SME continues to be very high. And these people, you see this, they are talking about now all the facilities which are coming, these are coming for the existing clients. Very correct, sir. New clients, where are they? They are not getting any support. New clients, they are going to NBFC sector. NBFC sector, they have also become very, very cautious now. And uh, then they are sanctioning at 17, 18% with the 100% security. And uh, the day they disperse first installment EMI, they take on the first day itself, like Baniya. Yeah, yeah, the interest is, is, is deducted from the first first day of the yeah, month yeah. itself. Yeah, first EMI is deducted from the disbursement. No, I agree, sir. And that is, it is it, it seems to be a very precarious situation for MSMEs, especially in this country, because right. with cost of funds, when it's going to be so high, Profitability will be directly impacted. There will be, you know, it, it will not be, it will not be difficult, difficult to f actually understand that SMEs will be out of business because if cost of funding goes to these levels, it is, it's, it's going to be impossible to export. It's going to be impossible to even make anything and sell locally, and you will never be profitable. That's right. No matter now, how much efficiency uh, and effectiveness you may, you might build in the operation. That's right. Now, like uh, the unit which are involved in COVID-related uh, uh, operations, Sidbi is lending at 5%. So if this scheme can be brought at 5%, why not other schemes? Very correct, very correct, sir. It should be around 5 to 6%. And when government is giving subsidy to agriculture, I think this uh, sector de uh, demands more uh, than agriculture. Yeah, There's a lot of employment is generating. Very yeah. correct, sir. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, sir. I mean, uh, I'd like to go over to uh, Siddharth, you know, coming to this point of, you know, how do we support MSMEs in the future? What is the possibility when it comes to, you know, this uh, imbroglio that we have, wherein we don't have enough funds available for MSMEs? What do you think can be done, Siddharth, in the future? Future, see, I always have said that a lot of MSMEs uh, need to be realistically looking at uh, what are their chances of survival and growth. That is why I have been recommending budget analysis. And I have also come across a lot of reluctance for maintaining uh, the family lineage and, you know, my son will inherit or my will inherit. And a lot of mindset issue uh, has to change. Uh, people will have to be more open to get outsiders uh, at a very early stage, late stage. But I am I am seeing a lot of companies without COVID any are facing succession issues. They don't have anybody to run the business. They are bank dead. They don't know what to do. And now the company doesn't know where to go. For them to actually get people bored at that later stage. Just saying, so what I'm saying is that when businesses are conceived, they are more or less the family ownership is uh, given. Okay. So I think from day one, we have to look at, they have to look at their employees as stakeholders because that's the only way you can handle a downtrend where the employees are also. So you will going forward, see companies as uh, maybe holding 20, 30% by owned by key employees. And, you know, it will not be ESOP any longer because that's the only way to get a buy-in. And, you know, if I'm a shareholder owning 5%, I will be more happier to take a pay cut it, it's as much a pay cut as me and good times I get the upside in terms of uh, dividend. They have to be very open more to merger and alliances rather than, you know, sitting and always waiting to be acquired. Or, you know, disintegrating because of a lack of succession plan. 
and also look at options of uh, raising equity going global much earlier than they do so then these then. are three four things which they probably need to you know uh, there is a common fallacy that okay listing this that private equity money is only for tech we don't have the bandwidth you know they have not invested also in professionals i think there will be a marriage where uh, high quality professionals will be willing to invest small sums and you know take the take over the management or participate very actively in the management rather than being a passive so point i'm trying to make is if i'm a vice president in an mnc and i lose my job i don't want to start a company but i would not mind maybe take a punt of 50 50 lakhs to crores uh, capital and you know take a good stake in these covid times and turn around the company because i have my personal credibility years of experience scaling up so point i'm trying to make is they need to invest and attract talent who can take them to the next level and not rely on whatever they have on hand so a lot of smes are grown by default yes the journey to 30 50 crores 100 crores may be easy based on internal talent but going forward you need new fresh ideas new markets and new funding sources as well so they need to explore more uh, and you know diversify their talent pool and human capital is a very very important resource here excellent excellent sir thank you very much for that insight i go to santosh santosh the, this is now the part 2 of the question which we left out earlier you know so you you are you, are, you please please add your valuable insight so, so vinod ji i think uh, good that i heard uh, my other panelists because that gives me some pointers to kind of put forward uh, and, and before i uh, kind of put forward my remarks uh, you know i represent avistar group which has been kind of putting equity and debt into msmes so we are a player in the financing ecosystem and and uh, the other hat that i wear that i advise the nbfcs and the msmes uh, who are either receiving loans or giving loans to the sector so 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 the two thing that i want to highlight and 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 not in kind of any particular uh, response to uh, my previous panelists but as a fact see the formal sector that sir talked about we earlier talked about uh, that lending at 5% or 7% you know that is very minuscule in overall scheme of msme financing so only a selected bunch of a few percentage of the overall msme get that now see the repercussions a firm getting 5% capital is competing with a firm in the same sector same space with 15% capital cost now how you will have the fair competition that that's the point number 1 so if you want to kind of increase the offering you make it such that it is available to large number of msme otherwise it creates a very different kind of problem point number 2 if entire msme sector is predominantly being catered by informal sector and informal sector i'm talking about nbfc who get capital at 11 the banks take them to lend to msme at 7% or 8% or 10% right yeah, it's not going to be possible very so correct so the point number point number 3 point number 3 is that msme you know they know that there is a fund available but they are not eligible for that so why create institutional mechanism and instrument which are not suitable for a majority of them now i'll summarize the three things on the point that uh, we are talking right now one is that that we need to work in the revisualizing the msme financing space and when i say revisualizing the role of uh, institutions like sidbi and others has been more of a lender they refinance or they lend directly or indirectly they need to go beyond that and see how we can not only be a lender and a player ourselves but enable other players to cater to the sector better so so i think cdb has done a number of things they have put some credit uh, loss guarantee scheme some fldz to enable the sector but even the implementation of those things have been kind of uh, not very very well done so that is still i can uh, wait for 6 months for my guarantee to flow in if default happens that is not going to factor in now the the two points so so the larger point i'm making how i can revisualize the whole financing landscape for msme so that msme become more competitive or more kind of productive and go to the recovery path that we are talking about the second point that i want to highlight is that we need to kind of revisualize the resilience discussion that we are talking about resilience has a cost resilience has a cost of transition resilience has a cost of building new system building kind of moving from existing system if you are not able to finance your core operations how you are going to build a cushion of resilience going further and also resilience comes as a kind of safety cushion not as a productive asset 
keep in mind often resilience comes as active cushion not as a productive asset so it is going to hit higher up so you have to think of financing resilience in a very very different way that's point number 2 now the third point that i want to make is that you know uh, if you look at the whole uh, discussion about uh, our msmes uh, not being technology savvy or not being competitive etc we have uh, two level of challenges one is the financing technology challenges Second is the technical expertise of that MSME to adopt to that technology. I think uh, uh, you know my previous speakers uh, Radhan uh, mentioned about that that how we require the technical manpower to be there. Now, making finance flow to MSME has a larger number of changes to be done in the ecosystem, and those include financing institutions, apex bodies, regulatory system, and the MSME themselves. They all need to change the way they are working. Otherwise, they don't go to uh, the objective that we have. the last point that i want to make that how financial institution uh, are kind of cooperating or kind of evolving in this ask uh, of covid so uh, my uh, firm sister concern intelligro uh, no now rebranded as aswa finance used to give loan uh, collateral free loan to msme in the range of 2 crores to 5 crore now suddenly we realize that by catering to that segment we are not making enough impact we are not reaching out to large number of msme Gosh. And, and probably we are reaching out to those who are already kind of on the verge of getting finance from existing banks. So we reassessed our offerings. Now we are going with 20 lakh ticket size. We will finance 20 lakh, which means that our transaction cost goes high. But we are reaching out to more needy because just keep in mind that 20 lakh ticket size recipients are those who are often not able to do any kind of collaterals because they are small firms. They don't understand the financing that well, and they are not being catered by formal institutions. so every institution need to think about that how we can change the way we are offering last point before i shut up uh, is that the need for uh, a, a kind of supporting msme on the financial recovery part of better i think the point siddharth ji made about uh, need for getting equity uh, msme should go and look actively for equity uh, a word of caution to msme who are listening right now if you are hit by a crisis and equity is the only way to kind of survive okay do you don't have any option but if you can survive without equity at this point of time please try to do so because equity will come at a very very low valuation people would give you not the right kind of valuation that are looking for because when the you are down in dump people want to acquire you just because uh, so uh, we have been getting a lot of msme is seeking equity we are advising them and we are saying that get the equity but get in the right terms it's not that equity is bad but you need to be very careful who you are getting on board and with what objective sometimes getting the right investor is much critical than the large valuation so i'll stop here thank you thank you thank you santosh i mean i uh, we, we are we are very clear with this i mean, i'd like uh, mr bajalia to sum up sir what we have heard from here and also tell people uh, all the attendees and friends here that are here that we have a finance desk which primarily looks at how we can help you attain maximum possible uh, uh financial position for that may be suitable for your enterprise or whatever and that desk is headed by shri bajalia sir bajalia sir uh, what we talked about today is various mechanisms right from reassessing strategies that we may employ uh, in our business today holding on to cash uh sidar talked about uh, mergers and alliances uh, also implementing uh, an in uh, in house sort of a uh, equity raise through through employees and share i mean very radical idea i mean I, a lot of people will find the resonance with it uh, you know uh, himendra talked about the working capital cycle and how do you reduce that from whatever you have today because that's in turn affecting your ebitda margins you know how do you add value to your uh, uh, product development cycle how do you offer more product more uh, for more money uh, so so build some margin there uh, and one of the most important things which is co corporate governance and compliance which is a dismal that is why most smes generally fail to attract uh, funding whether it is through banks whether it is through nbfcs or anybody and that's where the cost of financing becomes much more when you are when you are uh, you know compliance levels are very low and with this sir would you would you like to sum up uh, and uh, have closing remarks sir yeah uh, 
Mr. Uh, Santosh, uh, what I mentioned about 5%, it is uh, the recent started scheme for the unit who are manufacturing products related to COVID treatment. COVID, yes. So these are very, very few. This is not for the general, but there are certain schemes like subordinate debt, which is at around 8% or 9%. And SIDBI does not have that much manpower or that much bear with to sanction large number of accounts. I think if we consider total number of accounts, maybe a couple of thousand accounts. So uh, mainly the source of funds for SMEs is the banks. We have to, yeah. I mean, agree on that. These are the only banks. SMEs, uh, this NBFC, they have been financing. They are having problem also. But their total, you see this, if we take the total share of uh, NBFC, it is around 15% of the total outstanding exposure to the SME sector. And uh, the rest is major with the public sector banks and some part with the private sector banks. But you see this again, we have to uh, see equity and debt funds. Any SME which has to grow, which needs to uh, uh, take the best technology or he has to go for the best technology, digital marketing and all these things, he needs the funds. He can't survive on his own funds. The way he has to grow, he needs the funds. Either by way of equity or by way of loan from the banks. So banks is the major source for these SMEs. Now, uh, SMEs, when we divide into micro, small, and medium entrepreneurs. Micro, I think in India, a lot of uh, uh, companies or NBFCs, MF, MFIs, they are financing this uh, microfinance, and they are doing quite well. A large number has been covered under that. When we come to medium uh, industry, where uh, we are, we have now agreed that uh, this turnover sh should be around 250 crore. Their equity is available from good, good funds when they are doing good, when their efficiency is good, where their management is good, where their compliance is good. So they are getting the equity and they are getting the funds also. For medium industry, the major concern is to reduce the cost of funds. They want the additional funds at the lower rate of interest, at the lowest rate of interest. They are getting the funds, but issue is how they can reduce the cost. When we come to the SME, SME major part, these are the, when they start, these are the family business. They don't provide the information required. They don't have any collaterals. They don't have that management capabilities. Only that the person when he, he has completed his graduation or post graduation, he starts his own business, that type of business. Any industry, if a father is continuing, son will also uh, follow that. This type of industry, they are finding it difficult in getting the finance because they, uh, again, the major issue is that earlier, uh, they, they were not willing to pay the taxes. There were some SMEs where power theft was there. They were not going to pay the dues uh, related with the uh, labor to government dues and this thing. They wanted to avoid all those things. These things were happening. So SME uh, as a such, they face all these problems. But ultimately, you see this, if we see that government has made a lot of policy changes. Government is coming with a lot of policies. Reserve Bank is coming with a lot of relaxation and insisting that the flow of credit to this section should uh, be increased. Like it is covered under priority sector, you have to give 40% of your total loans to priority sector out of which 18% is for agriculture. Balance has to go for SME and uh, housing sector. So a lot of policy initiatives have been taken. Again, in the banks, again, it depends the person who is sitting on the counter. Some people are very cooperative. Any SME comes, they tell him what are the schemes available, how which are the best suited to them. But these are not happening in most of the banks. Generally, they are shown the door that, no, 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 you, you can't get the loan from here. Why don't you go to SIDB? Why don't you go to Cooperative Bank? Why don't you go to NBFC? So these type of things are happening. But I think now the government needs to take a very strong uh, decision on that. Each bank 
should be given a target that you have to assist so many new SME cases in a year. Unless it, unless it is forced upon on the banks that you have to decide. You, you select the quality, but you have to do the new clients who have no uh, past dealing with the banks. Let it will be financially inclusive. So this type of, I think, the, once targets are given, perhaps things will happen. Otherwise, if it is left to the banks, they will decide and they will give, nothing will happen. Thank you, sir. That was that was my concern also, that you just uh, confirmed mm -hmm. the banks that were more proactive. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, Sushma ji had a question to ask Hemendra. Hemendra is a well-known uh, equity uh, investor. So Sushma ji, your question, please. Sorry, yeah. I mean, question to Hemendra is, uh, uh, what kind of uh, businesses uh, are you looking at uh, uh, while funding, you know, um, uh, uh, in this situation? So, so what kind of businesses would you fund? And what is it that you would look at? So, uh, so now I am part of a venture capital fund. So we are essentially investing in now. And, uh, and that too, uh, on deep tech startups which have a proprietary tag or patented tag uh, with an option to, uh, uh, with an option to sell to large markets. So, so we are sector agnostic tech. So that will continue to be the focus. Uh, my personal focus is more in food and agriculture. I'm very excited about the sector. The kind of reform that we have seen in last couple of weeks or last two weeks on uh, scrapping of ECA and of APNC. It's a big positive. The government has okay. also announced the one one lakh crore infra fund for setting a facility near far, like we have churches. So we have talked about uh, the food and agriculture space. I think it's going to pick up big time. Uh, but uh, all I can say, whether it's an SME or a startup, uh, that will be critical. Huh? You know, more and more digital and food value chain, be it selling farmers, be it farm monitoring. Be it, uh, be it uh, digitization as a Kiran. So I think that those themes are going to pick up big time. So we we have to accept that technology will be at the core of any investment that's going to happen in this sector. Thank you. Thank you, Amendra, for that, that clarity. So uh, with that, Sushma ji, uh, uh, over to you. I think we have crossed our time. I'm sorry. But it was important to get everybody's viewpoint because all the people that are hanging in here were trying to figure out exactly what is it that all these financiers are looking at and bankers are looking at. So I think we've got a bit of a, uh, I, I would say, viewpoint from everybody. With that, thank you all, friends, for, for being here. Uh, I'd hand it back to Sushma ji. Thank you very much, sir. I mean, I once again thank all our esteemed panelists on the uh, finance panel for uh, such insights and um, experience shared and uh, the kind of policy reforms that are required. So thank you once again. It has been a great day uh, since morning and uh, there we have had some wonderful sessions, wonderful opportunities being discussed. And uh, I think we are all charged up and motivated to get our uh, business uh, back in track. And uh, I think we are all now geared up. So uh, I would like to invite uh, um, uh, Dr. Rene Van Berkel to uh, please come and uh, give closing remarks before we uh, end the webinar, please. Uh, thank you, Sushma, and uh, thank you to all. I think I should start with a big thank you because we have uh, been talking for a good three and a half hours with different panelists and so on, and we have had uh, very different perspectives from all corners of the country and from all different sectors. So that's been very rich, and I would like to uh, also thank that the partners who joined up with us in the SME Forum uh, as co-organizer and then uh, the support from the uh, Development Commissioner's Office, uh, MSME, the A ASDC, who was here with us earlier this morning and then the product and process development center and the uh, un india business forum i think I, I would like to make a couple of points as a as a as a way forward maybe i i, I think that it's obvious that we meet in very dire times so the the prospects are not great overall and we are in a and we are battling a crisis we are battling a health crisis human uh, 
uh, humanitarian crisis, economic crisis. So, so we are not in a meeting in a in a great place in that sense. And 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 how dire the situation will turn out is is ultimately uh, will be depending on our actions which we take right now. And that is that is the the positive things which I think that uh, that we cannot just wait and sing this sit this out, but we have to take as responsible as entrepreneurs, as small and medium sized uh, enterprises, also the responsibility to work ourselves out of the crisis and we don't know what will be the final outcome but we can make some 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 challenges and so on and ultimately i go back to uh, some of my friends who, who say yeah enterprising is is ultimately taking up calculated risks and if everything was known then you don't didn't need to become an entrepreneur so we we need to to uh, strength in this importance of uh, being entrepreneurial, uh, not blindly taking any risk, but taking informed insights and then moving forward and not just wait for others to come forward. I think that the discussions during the day or during the, the, the couple of hours that we had spent together have been very much uh, centered around a few theme so focus on on the people and the skills that we we get on their safety on their the quality of life on also on the health from the food and the health perspective i uh, focus on the technology and the quality and uh innovation and and uh, those aspects where you would say traditionally if you're on the on the if you want to hold on to your cash as somebody also say which i think is also important they would say oh forget anything which is innovation and so on but maybe one needs to expand a little bit to get back into business so one should not be just cutting down and, and cutting corners so cutting corners might uh, help you for a today's deal but will will hunt you tomorrow in that sense so i think that is uh, that is all an overall uh, strategy so so by going sheep and going cutting corners we will not get out of this crisis we might make a quick uh, buck but uh, uh, that will not help us ultimately there and and ultimately it is also a little bit i think recognize that part of the the challenge that we're facing is not specific to COVID, but COVID has kind of exacerbated the, the situation that MSMEs were in before. Uh, so I, I would like them to maybe close with uh, an invitation to collaborate because these are certainly issues that uh, UNIDO as the industrial development organization working with different partners is interested in to work on these issues of productivity, innovation, environment, entrepreneurship. So I really uh, would like to see this also as a, as a as a wrapping up, but as a first part of a, a collaboration to move us forward, to recover business, to revitalize business, and to also bring us back on the bigger agenda of inclusiveness, sustainability, economic development, uh, that has uh, maybe taken a bit of the backseat at the moment. So thank you very much to all. Sushma, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Renee. I also see uh, Sri Pani Sarvamji, so, Pani Selvamji, uh, would you like to say a few words? I mean, uh, the, any closing remarks? Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I just uh, see everything went very well. So, uh, uh, it's uh, because of all the supports that uh, I know for UNICO and uh, um, uh, MSME Forum, uh, because of all your efforts. And uh, it, it went very well. I think well, hopefully. Uh, the AS and DC also got impressed. We had a very good, uh, good remarks, and he was very happy for the day. And uh, I was listening to uh, all these panelists. It was very useful. So let us make all uh, the points, whatever uh, taken place, and then give it to DC MSME. We do the follow up yes. and uh, see that some actions are uh, taken place. And we will also collaborate with uh, UNIDO to take it. Uh, no, uh, launch the B3C uh, and uh, um, look forward for uh, uh, all uh, the good future for the MSME sector. So then, once again, thanks to uh, the UNIDO for uh, you know, joining with us and also the SME Forum for all the, 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 the good words and the support that you extend. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Vinod sir, for you, I mean, any any more um, remarks? No, there's no, there's no more remarks. I'm just folding my hands and saying to everybody, thank you very much. <laughs> this was the longest session I've ever attended on <laughs> and my butt hurts now. <laughs> so <laughs> that's it for today. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll see you soon. <laughs> Namaskar. So thank you. Um, uh, thanks to all the viewers, all our members who have uh, tuned in 
uh, here today for this uh, Building Back Business from Crisis uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Rene Van Berkel and the entire UNIDO team, uh, the, um, Shri Paneer Selvamji, the team at PPDC Agra, UN India Business Forum, um, and of course, uh, my team at India SME Forum, the office of DCMSME to support this initiative, and all the esteemed speakers uh, for uh, joining us for this program today and being so uh, such patient audience. Please keep sending your uh, suggestions and we will be working on it. As in the morning, we laid down uh, five points for the uh, roadmap to get back in business. And uh, we will take up for this with relevant authorities and ministries, and we will work our way once again uh, through this uh, COVID battle. Uh, with that, um, keep safe and uh, keep working always. Once again, a very, very happy International MSME Day to each one of you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Sushma. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Sohan, would you be um, Sohan? Are you there? Would you be uh, ending the? Thank you, Susma ji. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Padmini Sir. Thank you. Bye. Yes. Let's get that.